The Scope has received a joint declaration from the Angel Cartel and Garista's Pirates containing explicit threats directed at the proprietors of two citadels strategically positioned near the Jovian Stargates leading to Zarzak. The statement demands their immediate removal, underlining that non-compliance will result in their annihilation. The citadels in question are an Astrohus under the jurisdiction of the Decoy Alliance, situated in the GTAC Null Q86 system and a Fortizar operated by the Initiative Alliance and securely positioned in the Alsevoinen system. The Angel Cartel and Garista's pirates have issued a stern 24-hour ultimatum, setting a deadline for removal at any time after which they warn action will be taken against the structures. Alarmingly, the pirates are also encouraging Capsuleers to take part in the imminent attacks, claiming it will strengthen the bonds between them and the pirate aspiring Capsuleers. While not entirely unprecedented, it remains a rare occurrence for these pirates to seek cooperation from Capsuleers. This recent trend has raised concerns within the New Eden community that it signals a substantial shift in strategy on the part of the Angel Cartel and Garistas. After the Deathless onlined the system's long dormant stargates leading to Zarzak, the Angel Cartel and Garistas appear to have been ceaselessly preparing for forthcoming operations based from within the system. Through the strategic deployment of weapon emplacements, the Deathless has initiated the process of asserting control over the system, seemingly aiming to counteract the rampant violence that had previously plagued it. In tandem with recent pirate activities, these developments strongly suggest a concerted effort to incorporate Capsuleers into the planning of forthcoming pirate operations. The system of Turner has recently seen a significant increase in Capsuleer activity since the discovery of the Jovian Gate connecting it to Zarzak. Turner was the location of the experiments with a prototype stellar transmuter last year, which resulted in a cataclysmic failure that devastated the planet of Turner-1. Following that event, the system experienced increased wormhole activity, and now with the discovery of the Jovian Gate leading back to Zarzak, Capsuleers are seeing the opportunities presented in settling there. Groups like the Deepwater Hooligans, Volta, and Shadow Cartel are among those rumored to have settled in the system. What kind of relationships these Capsuleers will have with their Angel Cartel and Garista's neighbors living in Zarzak remains to be seen. Concord's Secure Commerce Commission plans to restrict script transfers to issuing corporations only in a response to money laundering by criminals and pirates. The restrictions will halt all loyalty point trading between individuals and private corporations. Trading in Evermarks will also be restricted as the currency is based on a corporate script. Alexander Dukas, president of Evermore, has criticized the announcement as a typically anti-business move from an overzealous commission. Evermore's legal team has filed for an exemption for Evermarks. The Scope understands that Dukas has deployed significant resources to exert pressure on the SCC. The SCC has confirmed that Evermarks will not be exempt from the initial suspension, but do not rule out a future exception. This is Alton Hovery reporting for The Scope. Greetings, fellow Empyreans. I am Astrothi, and let's go get some structures! How's it going, guys? Oh, welcome, welcome, welcome. We are... Today is about... Uh, tinfoil, right? Like, that, the news and what's going on. There's a ton of stuff to go over in that scope uh, from the ticker. Uh, so we're going to go over that, and then... I have a little bit of a, a, a running kind of, I don't know if bet is the right word, but disagreement with Danny about whether or not I can make it all the way to the end of the iceberg by the end of the day. So we're going to try to see if we can do that. I'm excited. You're excited. We're all excited. So settle in, like the stream, and we're going to jump into 
saying hi to everybody actually i'm not i'm not going to rush all the way into it i just want to do we have the timers for the astro and the fortazar so uh let's see the announcements says that the disassembly must begin within 24 hours. So they need to be able to, they, if they'd stop, we could very well be attacking this thing this weekend. No, they're not reinforced yet. They have, yeah, they've given 24 hours to unanchor notice. So we're going to have to see whether or not they do unanchor. But yeah. Okay. They don't uh they don't like people pooling LP in corpse. No, uh the concern is that as there's going to be a lot of shifts in the value of LP and new LP coming out, they don't this is good the first time that new LP and new LP sources for for new items has been released since the ability to to transfer LP was put out. So they don't want they I mean they don't want very much to ruin this feature uh which is why they shouldn't have bubbles but uh the point is is that um they wait Yeah, they don't want people to like so an individual can get LP, right? How long does it take for an individual to get enough LP to get the Angel Titan, right? If we could pool our LP, then we could collectively work towards the Angel Titan. And that means that people would get those BPCs significantly faster. And it would mean that groups that can collectively get together and earn LP would have a significant advantage over any individual effort. So uh, while we're having this early race and there's new introduction to new things from new LP stores, uh, it makes sense for them to kind of lock everything down uh, while, while everything shakes out. There's already a lot coming and a lot changing with Havoc. It's, it's basically just taking one more variable off the table. Does that make sense? So, yeah, um, I mean, so Havoc is on the 14th, and this is 24-hour notice. It's a low-sec system, so the, the attack could happen as such that we, that we are uh, finishing these citadels before um, Havoc is released. It, it, it seems that way. Who is the least likely to remove their citadel? Uh, initiative. Initiative are not going to, I mean, like, at this point, if I was either of them, it's a Fortazar and an Asterhus. I would keep it there just to see what the hell happens next, right? What, what CCP will do if they're successfully defended? Oh. Man. Is CCP, oh, is CCP willing to bust out the Angel Titans in this fight, right? All right. I'm... Yeah. How are you going to successfully defend your Fortazar when 10 Angel Titans jump in? That'd be pretty good. They'll fight and beat the NPCs. I mean, see, that's the thing, right? Is that this is a historic event if you think about it like it seems so minor but it really is historic in the fact that like a lot of focus is on these things now and the initiative is n is by far not a trivial organization so um it's gonna be it's gonna be good and also i think that like I'll put it this way. I think that Initiative already called the bluff when they put the Fortazar there in the first place, right? Because, like, from the very beginning, they were like, watch out. If you put a structure here, it may not work out because of all the gravitational walkie-wookie. And they were like, yeah, but 
we don't like your little you can'ts, so we're going to anyways. Uh, has CCP attacked player structures in the past? Yes. So there's a few uh, examples of this in um, in the earliest days. Uh, there was pirates that hi were uh, pirates versus pirates. I think it was Sancho was invading Angel Space, and so like player the angels hired players to attack the Sancha uh, posse to to knock them out. Um, but there has absolutely been several times where, like, Arataka Research Consortium's main structure, and I think Sasio, has been attacked uh, by Drifters, Sancha, Triglavians, and, and Concord. Well, I think they only got threatened by Concord. I hope those systems have already been moved to reinforced nodes. Well, uh, I mean, there's been a lot of activity there already. Let's see, hold on. So, uh, the initiatives is in, in Al Savoyden. So the initiatives one is in Losec, on the Losec side, in the Galente Caldari war zone, right? Whereas, whoops. The... Did, I, did they already do the other one? Yes. Okay. So Decoy Alliance is set in GTAC OQ86. So Decoy Alliance is on the Nullsec side in Angel Cartel space. Yeah, the other one is in Curse. All right. So let's get into the news in brief, because as we all know, the real news is in the ticker. Um, all right. Deathless Circle and pirate allies demand removal of capsular structures in Al Savoynan and GTAC OQ86. Fierce fighting in alternate system as state and federal militias battle for control of frontline system. Uh, so, I mean, I'm not going to say that this is 100% sure. But we do know that these... So one of the questions that we're going to be asking, and, and tomorrow I, I want to dedicate my episode to, like, preparing for Havoc, but we've been talking about where these invasion or the insurrections are going to start. They start in a front line. So the fact that this extra combat is being noted by CCP the week before means that um, I wouldn't be surprised if Aldrinet becomes the first Garissa's uh, front line. But we'll have to see. Uh, Angel Cartel and Grissus Pirates threaten capsular structures, owners with hostile action. Yes, yes, yes. Mimitar Militia offenses, uh, offensive eyes encirclement of key, key devoid systems as Imperial forces attempt to hold Arzod. Uh, again, this is Mimitar uh, faction warfare. In fact, um, let's see. Hold on. Let's see if we can do the front lines. I know it's going to be weird for now, but uh, so. Where do they say? It was Aldrinette and Arzad. So Aldrinette is, of course, right here. This is a very popular um, frontline kind of area. Uh, that would... It would keep most of this insurrection in null sec area or sorry in low sec area although uh let's see yeah i'm not sure we'll have to see if that one ends up a lot of the um 
If it becomes Alperena, that'd be pretty funny. And then the Amar side. Is Arzod. Now this one's a lot more interesting because Arzod is one, two. Uh, it's kind of close to this area. It's it's next to Mehathor. I don't. It'd be interesting to see if we can take Mehathor. That is one of the things I'm interested in. But um, and it also would put Vard and. That's about it for interesting systems that jump out to me. But yeah, so it'll be worth noting. We'll, we'll look next week and see whether or not these are the systems that got attacked or that get attacked. Um, Concord Inner Circle debates review of interstellar security, counterterrorism, and money laundering treaties. Uh, that's likely in regards to like the, the LP stuff. Cutting the Amar Empire from the rest of Highsec on the first insurgency. I one one can dream. Uh when we get the new launcher and we have both Vanguard out, do you think the number of players currently online will be, become both games? So one of the things that it seems pretty clear to me is that CCP is trying to market Vanguard as not a different game. Um, I, I think that the phrase that they used is they called it the shooter component of EVE Online, right? So not only is this one universe, one war, but they want to see it as one game with multiple clients, depending on which clone you're in, if that makes sense. But yeah. At any rate, uh, well, it'll be interesting to see if they break de break down um, the numbers between the two. In Dust, I don't think that the numbers, like, well, I don't know if they displayed in the same way back then. Either way. Uh, Garissa's pirates reported smuggling weapons to Intaki Prime separatist and anti-Kaldari -Kal elements in Syndicate. This is an interesting one because, like, Syndicate is that area of space that the Kaldari have occupied. So the Garistus is, you know, continuing to try to uh, unravel the Kaldari, as it were. Um, well, actually, both the Galente with the Separatists and the uh, element, the anti-Kaldari elements in Syndicate. So kind of the Garistus is trying to put put fuel into the fire uh, of the kind of the political weak points of these empires at the moment. Sucker Tribe clashes with Society of Conscious Thought over suggested sharing of wormhole navigational da navigation data. So, obviously, the Thrucker Tribe are probably the most connected to uh, wormholes um, of all of the tribes. They also are, um, like, the Thucker worked with Sisters of Eve to find Thera and all that kind of stuff. So they are considered to be probably one of the most forerunning experts in wormhole space and wormhole mechanics. Um, Society of Conscious Thought, obviously, uh, Jovian aligned, also very interested in, you know, um, kind of investigating their own stuff because the Jove, as we know it, is gone. And so the Society of Conscious Thought are left behind with the inheritance of the Jove, Jovian race, but not any of the age or wisdom, right? So, um, you know, the, if there, what's interesting to me here is, what exactly do they mean by wormhole navigation data? Is this wormholes? Is this like, hey, let me into your Pathfinder? Or is this like the Thuckers have begun to investigate or discover the, the, the random or seemingly random, the true nature of the wormholes such that they understand more about how wormholes connect, right? Um, because there is a, a, a popular theory, um, or it's speculated about even in by in universe characters that the wormholes themselves are not random right that we just see them as random because we don't understand what is making them do what they do um that's weird 
A module, yeah. Uh, lazy one. I didn't. I sorry. I don't know. I'm sorry, man. Uh. So. Let's see. Caldari State files route permanent status motion with Concord Assembly over Othanun Samanuni Stargate pair. This one has me sad, right? So, basically. Uh, do I know where things are on this, on this map? Oh, there it is. So here is the system of Othanun, right? Othanun is just this dead-end system, you know, whatever. But Othanun has a stargate that was built by the Kaldari militiamen that connects all the way to here, Samanuni and Hisek, which is also the, uh, the Kaldari headquarters, right? Now, this gate is only on when the Kaldari control it. So one of the funny things that people can do is if the Galente take this system, that Stargate shuts off, right? However, there was a bug, and this bug did a couple of things. One, uh, well, really what it does is it makes it so that you're the autopilot attempted to route through that Stargate even when it was offline, uh, which got a lot of people killed because this is a dead end in low sec. So you end up here, you warp to the Stargate, and then you figure out it's offline and there's a camp there and you die, right? So uh, while funny, CCP decided after some time that that wasn't cool. Um, however, the way that they uh, were able to fix it, for now, it would seem, was uh, to just cut that route. So, or, like, make it so it don't, the autopilot no longer m makes that route track. Even when it got reconnected, I think that the, it still doesn't route things through it, right? So, the question was, are they going to fix it to make it so that it behaves correctly or something else? And it would seem that this is uh, kind of warning us that likely they're just going to make it into a full-fledged gate connection. Like, it was fun for a while, but eh. Uh, all right. Caldari activity in Turner system increases after Aftermath and Stellar Transmuter incident in Jovian Stargate discover Discovery. Oh, Capsuleer activity. Sorry. <laughs> I read that wrong. I was like, Caldari activity? That's interesting. But no, that's what they just talked about. Intaki Assembly renews formal protest at militarization of Intaki system as a federal counterinsurgency force is increased. Uh, you know, tension. Don't don't forget, Intaki's not solved yet. You know, like there's a lot of people still really mad about Intaki. Um, Minmar Mimitar Republic deny Egmar and Vard prototype stellar transmitter experiments amidst alarm at stellar emission variants. Right. So. Um, Eagle Firefly, actually. Hold on. Friend of the show, Eagle Flyer Firefly. Right? It, or is it Eagle Fly? Hold on. Uh, yeah, no, it's Eagle Firefly. Okay. I had a moment of like, am I, uh-oh, have I been saying this wrong the whole time? So, he has this uh, video where he was talking about how the Ojai Stargate... Wow, that's very loud. The Ojai Stargate has been disrupted. Now, what does that mean? When um, the Turner... Sorry. Yeah, when Turner began to destabilize, it was first noted because it had fluctuations in its... Uh, in the light that was given off by the star. You could actually turn the camera and see these flashes pretty noticeably. And they were increasing in... Uh, well, they were very regular, and they were getting faster and faster and faster as time went on. So, Eagle Firefly made this video um, back in 
two weeks ago, uh, basically stating that the Ohide star has begun showing signs of disruption like um, much like Turner has, right? Does he have does he just show this? Okay, well it's cool anyways. So I think that that's what this is a reference to. Right? Uh, let's double check. Well, this says Egmar and Vard. So I don't know. I don't know. There have been many rumors going on about um, the, the, you know, obviously keeping an eye on these stars, given what happened to Turner. And Egmar and Vard were the other two besides Turner. And as we noted, v uh, I think it was Vard is going to be in uh, range of that insurrection if it goes where it goes. Or if it goes where we said, or where I thought it might. Amar Empire and Galente Federation pr propose Alcevoinen to Turner Systems be permanently garrisoned by Edencom forces. Uh, yikes. Edencom is an Amarian plot. Uh, Kaldari Colonels in Syndicate Region report successful low orbit cargo slingshot by modified military state shipcaster. Now, this is an interesting one, too, because like I said, that Kaldari story, the Kaldari occupied syndicate, and they've been pretty quiet since then. But if you've been paying attention to the news, there has been a lot of experimentation. As soon as that shipcaster was built by the state, they began experimenting on using it to get to syndicate. So it really seems like, especially in the state's case, the development of the shipcaster for the use in faction warfare was almost secondary and they have other plans for it and now they have been able to launch launch things out of a ship caster and get it into low orbit you know what that tells me that sounds very vanguardy what occupied is a bit of an overstatement well wait uh of syndicate i mean like they possess it now i mean like they have their const they, they, they occupy that constellation they built structures all that stuff anyway hold on sorry my uh bezos was listening in on me i had to be quiet all right. Uh, any anyway, rate, so next. SEC reports deta uh, details large increase in illegal script trading in black markets and financial instruments. Fine. Uh, Concord Assembly hears protest petitions from citizens of Bar Creek, Illinois, Gislares, and Ohide over Empire Stellar Transmuters. Those are the locations of the four Empire Stellar Transmuters. Intaki Bank decries knee-jerk reaction by Concord <coughs> and condemns plan restrictions on corporate script and currency trading. Kaldari Navy refuses to comment on claims state and republic collaborating on improvements to inter interstellar ship casters. Uh, you know, we know that the 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 Deathless is kind enough to build us fobs with tethering. For us to jump into, whereas the ship casters, as we have it uh, for the empires, uh, don't have very much protection, famously. So may hopefully they'll uh, work on some of that. Evermore corporations file complaints to empire trade authorities over SEC decision to restrict script trading. So here's my bet. OK, my bet was they didn't have a way like th when they made it so that you could trade LP. They just made it so you could trade LP and it was agnostic to what kind of LP it was, right? So then they found themselves in the problem where they couldn't shut off all of the LP uh, but Evermarks because Evermarks is an LP. So while they're trying to build that system so they have a little bit more granular control, it all has to be shut off. But obviously Evermarks has the best claim 
in universe to have themselves be exempt from the SEC. So it makes sense that as soon as they're ready to roll that out and they have that the, you know that the, that extra you know work done to the feature, then hey, lo and behold, Evermarks are now allowed to be done, and also maybe these other corporations, you know, whatever. Uh, it may even be filed with the same thing where like we can't tax different corporations LPs differently. That'd be really cool to be able to do that. Uh, Angel Cartel military buildup repeatedly confirmed by DED and Edencom operatives as Azrael class Titan test flights rumored. Yeah. Uh, Concord's AG-12 sharing group demands for access to shipcaster developments backed by Amar Empire and Galente Federation. So the Kaldari and the Mimitar are working on new shipcaster tech, you know, developments. And so the Amar and, sorry, yeah, the Amar and the Galente are trying to leverage Concord. So AG-12 is basically uh, the group of Concord that are, that are, um, their job is to ensure that no one empire gains technology above and beyond any other empire. So, um, basically, the Amar and the Galente are trying to leverage AG12 to get that information, which is basically what happened with the spying row, but more out in the open right now. Um, uh, to do Am Amatar. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, Deathless Circle Shipcaster Construction Project apparently in advanced state as CDIA assesses intelligence from Zarzak. Yep, we're almost there, guys. Amatar Defector claims Empire plans, quote, full-scale invasion of Molten Heath, end quote, in defiance of Concord treaties. So, the Amatar is Ardashapur. We have obviously been keeping track of uh, Tashmer Khan because, we, as we all know, Tashmer Khan will one day invade Stain. But in the meantime, there has been a lot of buildup, including infrastructure, power, and military buildup by Sorum and Ardashapur um, in the Amatar Mandate area. And so... Molten Heath is noted because it is M Mimitar area, but it's also the area that was used in Dust 514 and therefore has always been intimately tied with the shooters, the war clones, etc. So, um, you know, this kind of tracks. I don't, I don't know, man. It's going to be interesting if they can invade in a new area. You know, now that it, it, if the insurrections work, who knows what they're going to do next with it. Kaldari State Mimitar Republic denounce Edencom proposals to uh, as a plot to divide New Eden between authoritarian blocks. Yeah, so um what was the Edencom proposal? Oh, I missed one. Edencom intelligence claims strong sign of increased conflict between Triglavian Collective and Drifters in Abyssal Dead Space. That's interesting, right? Like, they keep doing this. I know that people like to say that, like, oh, the Drifter plot or the Trigolavian plot is on standby. It's just kind of beneath our notice right now. But there is stuff going on. Um, What was the Edencom thing that they would... I guess it was the... I assume that they're talking about the AG-12 stuff. Maybe. Uh, Amatar de uh, Defector also claims Amar intelligence officials met with, quote, Triglavian leadership Troika to dis discuss military pact. So we've, okay. This is the speculation, okay? I just jokingly mentioned the whole, like, uh, why should they be ex exempt? Uh, because uh, Evermarks and Interbus are, like, an inter- Empire um, institution. Should I be silly for some deep, deep cover against Drifter Doomsday? Uh, so here's the thing about that. We've been kind of watching this idea where, as I was jokingly mentioning earlier, sort of half jokingly mentioning earlier, uh, when, when Tash Murkon invades Stain, they will be invading Sancha right? 
And uh, there have been some struggles between Amar and Sancha. But more importantly, uh, Tash Murkon and, uh, you know, there has been these rumors of Triglavian leadership. And as we learned in the iceberg on Tuesday, uh, I, I believe that it is possible that how Svarog has become corrupted. Um, and if that's true, then there is like, and that's, or at the very least, the Triglavians want to destroy the Sancha. So if they're going to have a military pact, it will likely be with their unified enemy in Sancha. However, you could actually just take everything I just said, except for the stain stuff, uh, that last sentence at least, and, and slip out uh, Sancha and put in drifters, right? When the drifters attacked, they attacked the Amar. They, the drifters killed the Amar Empress. The drifters and the Amar have a long uh, struggle with each other. And we also know that the Triglavians are, are, are potentially preparing a second invasion. So with all this stuff about wormholes and other things like that, and an increased uh, focus on drifters, are the Triglavians about to be prepared, or are, are the Triglavians preparing to invade directly into the drifter homes? We'll have to see. Uh, Captain Marshal Serdan Sirkosh dismisses ravings of a traitor, saying imperial policy is peaceful and le legal reclaiming of rebel provinces. Um, that's to the person who, the, the defector, right? So, uh, Molten Heath also could be interesting because uh, the Triglavians could be seeing a problem with the war clones as well. What is the Abyss supposed to be? Eldritch Horror Space? No, it's... Um, so, Abyssal Dead Space is, is subspace, right? Like... Uh, hold on. This is actually really cool. This is worth waiting for. Hold on, hold on. And then we'll get to the tinfoil thing. Or do we have anything more? Uh, Concord monitors and Potchfins report large-scale redeployments of new ships to, and world arcs to shipyards resupplied with raw materials. So they're getting ready for something. Edencom plays down threats of new invasions given uh, evidence of new off uh, offenses in abyssal dead space by drifters and triglavians. So... Eden comes like, no, 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 no. It's probably not that big of a deal because the uh, the Drifters and the Triglavians are fighting more in, in Abyssal Dead Space, which is kind of taking their focus off of us. Let me see if I can find... If I don't find it right away, then I guess I can move on. But do... I can usually find it when I look for it. No. Wait. Ah, found it. Hold on. Hey, there we go. So this is a ship in normal space. And this is it entering into warp. And it then pops back up. And if you see that subspace is down below. Um, God, I wish I could remember off the top of my head who, that, who it was that made that video. I think he works for CCP now, though. Um, not mine. Can't remember who it was. He's done a lot of those other images, too. At any rate, um, so... If you think about it, if you keep on going down from warp, this video. No, no, the space pope made the theory, but the guy who made this video, um, he didn't make the video. Either way, I, I digress. So you see, the abyssal do dead space is down below. So like, if you go through a gate, you go deeper. That's why you can't see um, normal space when you're going through a, a jump. But 
abyssal dead space is even lower it's like these they discovered these pockets of uh gravitational anomalies inside of like just above raw subspace so it's got these like massive gravitational forces and fluxes but they've somehow managed to either make or find these stable pockets that they use as their uh, conduit network. Okay, so subspace is like another dimension of space-time that ships travel through and warp. It's kind of like the warp in Warhammer 40k. Uh, it was explained by the space pope as being like, um, known space is like being on the surface of water, and then subspace is like going underwater. So as you go just barely underwater, you can still see above water, but it's all warped and distorted. But if you go deeper, eventually you can't see anything clearly uh, from up above, and eventually no light, you can't even see the light from, from above in the, in the abyssal depths, you see? So there you go. The warp is another dimension. Uh, in other words, like a separate plane of reality in Warhammer 40k as far as I know like it's a different space in in Eve it's more like a different dimension of space time right like we have the three dimensions of space time that we can detect the theory being is that there is a fourth dimension of space time that is sub like that we experience as subspace effectively right and and the key here is is that uh, bosons, um, I think it is, right? Higgs bosons, Higgs, only interact on this plane, uh, you know, uh, on this side of subspace, which is why we have things like gravitate, like we have, um, or it, it interacts in the, in the same, uh, um, in a particular way. That's why you can like pass through another object like a planet when you're in warp is because you don't actually interact with other ob you know you're, you don't have mass in the same way that you do in normal space so you don't actually have to go very deep into subspace you just have to go deep enough into subspace pull you just under so that way it effectively um gets rid of the limitations of physical space i.e uh, you can pass through things and you can travel faster than light. Yeah, that is why. All right. Uh, yep, that's it for that. Yeah, Sea of Souls is a different plane of reality. So, uh, when I, what I'd like to think about is that um, in 2019, when I met with CCP Paradox, or, um, at E Vegas, uh, first of all, he asked me to pronounce Triglavians Triglavians, I'm pretty sure, <laughs> so that's why I pronounce it that way. Um, somebody in the comments, the, uh, on my, one of my previous videos said that I pronounced it wrong, even though the video was pronouncing it correctly. It's like, there's a reason why I pronounce it the way I do. But, um, also, uh, I asked him, is there any other books or anything that would help us understand the Triglavians? Because he suggested, well, it was, it was kind of the, several of the CCP devs talked about how the Triglavians were largely, or not largely, but inspired by the Trisolarians, and that CCP had been reading the three-body problem and really, really inspired by that when it came to this. So that's spooky, if you know anything about the three-body problem. But, um... The point is, I asked him, is there any other books that uh, w would apply or anything else, any other hints about the nature of the Triglavians that he could give us or give me? And he said, uh, have you read Flatland? And Flatland is a, a, a story about basically a three-dimensional being interacting with a two-dimensional being and like how a two-dimensional being would experience a three-dimensional being passing through their realm and what would happen if a two-dimensional being was pulled out of three dimensions and like their mind blown or out of two dimensions and their mind blown because they can't comprehend uh anything else because all they know is it, like their their entire existence is built around two dimensions and then of course at the end 
the three dimensional being is then you know contacted by a fourth dimensional being. It's like oh wait, the, you know it goes it goes further than this, right? So the idea of multidimensionality, uh, you know that that's one of the reasons why I always go back to that in my theories, which we'll talk about in the iceberg today. Okay, speaking of iceberg, if we don't get started soon, I might screw the pooch. So let's go. I just realized, hold on. I did not even get a picture of the iceberg. I, I closed all my pictures of the iceberg. <laughs> uh, yikes. All right, if you want to follow along. I didn't lose five, 45 minutes ago. This was planned. This was all planned. All right. I'm probably not I'm going to try not to go recover things that are up here. I'm going to refer to other things so that way we can go over. I also have other videos that I might refer you to. This is more to introduce you to the various different theories. Especially since as we get deeper and deeper, we're going to have m less evidence and more wild speculation. These are more like things I have heard from people at some point more than anything as we get deeper. All right, so let's get started. The Adheduwani. The Adheduwani is the group that uh, I think is uh, kind of one of the more interesting ones insofar as the fact that like as soon as somebody decides to jump into the lore, they think they've figured it out. They understand the four empires. They understand the Jove. They know about the Jovian disease. They know that the sleepers are connected with the Joe somehow, all this sort of stuff. And they're like, okay, I'm going to figure out what's going on. And the very first thing is like, well, the Adhead Yuani, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, what the f is an Adhead Yuani? So there was a, a lot of the lore, a lot of the stuff about EVE Online, uh, specifically the books Theodicy, Empyrean Age, and Templar One were written by a dude named Tony G. Whatever you think about the man, which obviously there are, or not obviously, but there are some people that really doesn't like what he did. That's a whole story for another day. I've talked about it in other shows. Um, but the point is, is that his stuff is still canonical, right? Uh, like it's it's the stuff. So um any rate, the reason why this is important is because the word Edhediwani is only found in uh, in his writings. There's no references to it in game. There's no references to it to them in any other chronicle uh, as by name. So there are two major times that we encounter the Adhediwani, or at least get told about the Adhediwani. The first is in uh, Theodicy, which I've done a complete reading of. You can go and watch them. Uh, Ari Danika did the, edited them all. There's a playlist of them. It's huge. It's a great story. At any rate, so this Jovian named Grius is talking to this girl who's been hearing voices and uh, he's now explaining to her what's going on. She hears the voices and knows of them as the Order. And he goes, uh, she goes, the Order is threatened by the Amar Empire. He goes, the Order, we call them in Hedyuani, do not fight their own wars. They have empires fight for them, which they achieve by controlling the influence of those who rise to power. But the Mimitars were not supposed to collapse so quickly. And it appears that they also underestimated the impact of the Amarian religion on society. So they have successfully involved us to reset the balance that is most favorable to them. Uh, the Adheduani are our greatest enemies and our enemy, and that makes them your greatest enemy as well. We cannot sit idly while they are selfishly interfere with the history that is yours to decide, no matter how destructive or how often you wish to repeat it. Um... And then he says, what is it? She asks, what does it had you want to mean? And he says, there's no translation in your language. Um, then. He talks about how they activated a sleeper agent, which is whatever. Uh, the, but the Adhediwani's ability to remotely sim sim stimulate neural pathways assigned to the audio functions of the human brain that is science beyond our comprehension, at least for now. So basically, they're able to beam messages into her brain. Uh, the, the technology they had, Yuani, is much more advanced than our own, Viola. 
They possess absolute mastery of quantum physics and particle science, and the telltale sign of their presence is nonlinear teleportation. Transporting man matter instantaneously across space without the use of wormholes, stargates, or jump drives. It can be done, but not by us. So first of all, lots of uh, spookiness when it comes to um, the, like, this is all the stuff that we're dealing with now with the ship casters and stuff, right? So, uh, so if we see here, the Adhediwani are depicted as either a sub-branch of the Jovians or a group that the Jovians are secretly struggling against. I think that he literally calls them out as being originally Jovian, or, you know, like a, a group of Jovians, <coughs> right? And this is what he's saying. He, they eventually, um, like, in the end, spoilers, uh, Grius dies, but he makes it a point, he says something about uh, that she can't tell him how he dies. Yeah, he goes, Viola Ant uh, Antones, Grius said, taking her by the shoulders and speaking just inches away from her face, if what Faust said to you is true, then I will see you again. When that day comes, do not tell me how I met my end. Do you understand? Do not tell me how I met my end. So, and then he says, kill me in, in plain view of the guards. Do it. Um, and then Foss, kills, which is the Namarian guy, kills Grius. Um, and, that and then towards the end, at the very end... Um, I think, yeah, Grius shows back up as a clone. Um, but then, yeah, they are not without their weakness. He says, Ch -ch -ch. Um, Amar's thirst for power is far too easy for the Order to exploit. This is the only way to remove that option from them and to ensure that they are no longer use us in their schemes against you. But what is their motive? What do they want from us? Grius thought for a moment before answering. Their interest lies in reshaping the course of mankind according to their own design. Their design? Why not just conquer us outright by use of force? Because they desire for you to embrace them on your own free will. And they hope to accomplish this by forcing us into wars with each other? If need be, yes. But waging wars against something so powerful, they are not without their weakness. But for now, all we can do is work, work to thwart their efforts in operating within the empires as best we can. So, remember when we were talking about the Shadow War, uh, the War of a Million Lies? This could very well be kind of what they're talking about, right? This war of manipula like this manipulation and struggle of infiltration versus protection, right? Evil with no boundaries from within and from without, everywhere and everywhere. How can we face this enemy without your help? By finding the strength to face the evil within first, Grievous answered. So why am I telling you that? So then, I, w I introduce you to this one first because... Oh, sorry for the light mode. Hold on. Can I dark mode this? I think I tried this before and it doesn't work. Nope. All right. Sorry. Uh... Yeah, it doesn't do anything. All right, so this is Grius. However, uh, let me set the stage, and there's some spoilers here. So um, basically, uh, this Amar dude, um, who is a scientist, was put in a ship to go watch the Eve Gate. And he's been sitting here slowly going mad with his medical drones keeping him alive and taking care of him. Uh, for a while, uh, making logs, and you've been reading his logs throughout this mo uh, most of this book up until this point. When this uh, drone comes up, uh, shuts off his his uh, system, uh, breaks in, and uh, he wakes up being hooked up to this whole apparatus. And this um, person, this appar apparition, yeah, uh, shows up that that makes sure to point out that um he's not a he's not the real grius he is yeah he goes how long have uh i can't who were those people before i answer grius said remember that you're speaking with a ghost the jove imprinted on my memory stack of this ai no longer exists um do you uh there are things he could say that i could not do you understand 
Or, uh, yeah. So then he says, what you call the sleeper civilization has origins that predated the collapse of the Eve Gate. You already know that they are uh, our direct ancestors. By the height of the first Jove Empire, they were an elite scientific subculture whose prestige stemmed from proficiencies in cryostasis, fullerene-based quantum computing, virtual reality, and bio-cybernetic technologies. They were undisputed masters of virtual worlds, able to create parallel existences almost indistinguishable from reality, as well as new clone anatomy that allowed seamless passage between the two. Imagery began taking shape before my eyes, show the significance, blah, 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 blah. To understand the sleepers, you must... Uh... Yeah, he's talking about the original origin of the, of the Jovians here, uh, where he talks about the fact that they came in with these seven ships. Seven massive vessels entered the picture. Um, this is the Eve Gate, as it was right before, right after collapsing 15 years ago. Few stargates were operatable in New Eden, and the warp drives of the era relied heavily on a fuel where, whose supply was tightly controlled by powerful factions. This fleet of ships, which is the seven ships, contained what we call the architects. They are your so-called sleepers, Doctor. They were commissioned to build the first stargates of Jove civilization, which at the time occupied a single colony in New Eden. You know it today as the Utopia system. It may seem ironic to you, but they were the most technologically inferior and destitute race at the time. These seven ships passed uh, through before the cataclysm, but were not fully fueled. Faced with extinction, they pressed on to their in intended destination, the Heaven Constellation, 30 light years from New Eden. The only reason why they even could even consider the voyage at all was because they built their mission around cryostasis for virtual storage. With no assistance from warp drives, this journey would take decades to, uh, to complete. So, um, the architects con con convalesced in time-dilated virtual reality to keep their minds prepared for the task at hand. But the crew you see caring for them had the greatest responsibility in the entire history of the Jove Empire. They were guardians of their race, during the most vulnerable time, they, along with the ship's captain, were called the Adhedyuani. So, in this case, we see Grius, the same person. Cat. Cat. You want, you want to be seen by the stream, don't you? You, you? you pretend like you don't want to get picked up, but then you do stuff like that. That's, that's, that's how to pretend. Come on. You scared? All right. All right. Ah, uh, so, um, so basically, the Adhediwani were uh, the pilots and crew of the ships, while the architects were the ones that were in uh, in stasis. So, uh, those literal motherships, each with some thirty thousand architects on board, stowed away. Blah blah blah. The virtual re worlds. Inhabited by the passengers, or as primitive, the construct. Uh, providing safe passage was just the beginning of their obligations. Uh, oh, yeah, it says, They dwelt within memories of the home that they had left behind, anguishing over the prospect for survival if they ever reached their final destination at all, at all. They tried to test the construct, push its limits, break its inadequate laws, and for many, rebel, rebel against it. The captains of those ships had to make unfathomably difficult decisions during that journey. That seems pretty ominous, right? Because, like, uh, what does that mean? So, like, there's, there's guys in stasis in, in virtual reality, and some of them are rebelling. So then the people on the outside have to make difficult decisions. It really seems like they, uh, they probably killed some people, right? Yes, the accusation here is that the architects are the sleepers. Like, this is the proto-sleepers. Uh, providing safe passage was just the beginning of their obligations. The core mission of the Adhediwani was to guide the architects from their virtual world back to a reality at journey's end. Once there, they presided over the construction of the gates and the establishment of the colony. To their internal credit, all seven succeeded, securing our foothold in the New Eden Cluster. Uh, what made it collapse? I am forbidden. Why can't you tell me? Uh, the fact is... Hold on. Uh, the Amar Empire had devoted immense resources to uncovering the dark mystery, finding the, uh, nothing but dead ends. Their motivation was founded in the search for a superior weapons technology, but I was driven, but I was driven by something else. The fact is, when the most advanced civilization of mankind collapses, we'd better understand the reason why. 
Lagrius continued as though I had never spoken. By the time the Second Empire arose, he said, the architects had transformed into an elite subculture and one of the most powerful and influential forces in our civilization. Um, and then... Uh, do they talk any more about the Adhediwani? Uh, here we go. Sorry. <laughs> there it is right there. The Adhediwani began overt attempts to influence our way of life directly, a proactive plot to guide our world closer to theirs. So here we're seeing that idea of like manipulating for, for their own good, which is very common within the Joe. Uh, they played the role of gods, deciding what new technologies to unveil, which leaders to support, and sabotaging interests they believe didn't align with their interpretation of the greater good. For a time, we tolerated it. But then the disease happened and everything changed. So uh, here's the thing. In the Echoes game, when it first came out, there was in the lore section uh, some lore that I believe was accidentally there um, because they didn't know any better. But Echoes is not technically canonical. But in that lore, it said that the Adheduani had... Um, turn themselves into beings of light. So my theory is, is that the Adhediwani were in fact the elders, but I think that's later on in the, that's who the Adhediwani are. Let's keep going. Sancha and the Broker. Oh, sorry. Before we finish, there is also this, uh, this post called um, Compilation Speculation, the Allure of the Adhediwani and what they may have become by Uriel, who is now working for CCP. So... You know, it's it's a very good breakdown of all of the stuff if you're interested in more. And I also have made a video uh, entitled The Torag Se uh, Sephirim and the Edhediwani. And you'll learn more about those other two here in a little bit. Um... Oh, yeah. Back to here. So for the next one, the Sancha and the Broker, um, the Broker is the, the main power player from Templar, or sorry, Empyrean Age. He's this kind of mysterious figure uh, that puts Tybus Heth in power, tries to get the Inserum serum stopped, uh, etc. So he doesn't actually appear in Templar 1, but... In the epilogue, or rather, after the epilogue? Yeah. After the epilogue, there's a single page, afterward. Just outside the borders of Caldari space, hidden in an unremarkable asteroid belts of systems abandoned by prospectors long ago, lurked a series of outposts. The inside of these hardened structures were crammed with highly advanced technical equipment, usually the sort found in Empire stations. Vast data core centers linking to fluid routers, all still active, sat alongside cloning equipment, including crews with the clones waiting inside. Curiously, lockers filled with neatly arranged garments of all manners of styles were also present, despite the fact that none of them, none of the more customary creature comforts associated with the common researcher center. In each of these outposts, everything was covered in dust. A sentient life form chanced upon one during a belt surveying mission and promptly informed its master. Within hours, its smaller companions had broken inside, not realizing how lucky they were. A thermonuclear device powerful enough to atomize the asteroid upon which they stood had somehow failed to detonate following an unauthorized breach. Whoever had rigged it had made a mistake. It was one of many the broker made towards the end of all of his, uh, end of his physical lives. So, uh, what should you read after the Imperial Age? Templar 1. So, um... So basically what we're seeing here is this sentient life, um, which is also, hold on, isn't there, hold on, informed its master. Okay, never mind. Uh, I thought that. 
it does refer to them as a drone or whatever. But the thing is, is that the key here is that the beginning of chapters in this book, if the chapter, uh oh, are they not going to do it? Neat. Either way, uh, at least in one of the books, or in some of the ch ah, see, on chapters that are related to a certain thing, there's that thing's logo at the top right, right, or the first page. No, Burning Life is technically first, but it's also not necessarily connected to the wider whole, if that makes sense. So the point that I'm trying to make is that is my evidence that um. This is a Sancha drone group or a Sancha group finding the uh, the broker's cash. Now, what would Sancha do with the broker's cash? Never figured it out. All right. The broker impersonated Alexander Noir. So some of you may know about this event. There's peace treaties between the Galente and the Caldari um, and... The Ishikone CEO uh, was on board that station, um, and the Ishikone was working on Inserum, which was the drug that to help against the Vitok um, used by Trigla by the Amarians to control the Mimitar. Uh Is that it? Says one of many outposts. So, this happens. Yeah? We're broadcasting live from inside the Ishikone headquarters in Malkalin, where the scene is utter chaos. This summit was supposed to bring hope to Galente Kaldari relations, but the Federation escort, a Nick's mothership flown by Alexander Noir, has set a deliberate collision course with the station. Thousands of people are forcing their way to escape hangars now, and our team is desperately trying to make it out on one of the evacuations. So that um, was one of the significant events that triggered the Empyrean War. Uh, which was basically the start of faction warfare. Um, and as you can see, the Alexander Noir flew the Nix in, and that managed to kill the Ishikone CEO. However, uh, if we go to the Empyrean Age itself, we will read what, hap what actually happened to Alexander Noir. This does get kind of gra gra graphic. Hold on. Where'd it go? Yeah. Admiral Alexander Noir took his last steps, entering the doorway to his spacious room, wondering why the bay windows overlooking the valley were left open. A gentle breeze was blowing inside, bringing in a waft of humidity and smell of flora outside. Moving forward to reach the control that would close it, he was startled to see a man walk purposely out from around the corner, where the doors leading to an outdoor deck were. Alex was at first confused, and then utterly disoriented as he found himself face to face with a perfect image of himself. It was as though he was standing before a mirror, except for this man, before him, was barely dressed and wearing gloves and sleeves made from reflective material. Before he could speak, the imposter waved his hand as a magic wand, and a grayish blast mist streamed outward from a canister, catching Alex fully in the face and neck, and then spreading like a shadow over every inch of his body. Millions of nano slints, nano license, microscopic butchers designed to obliterate the cell membranes of every organic object in its path began flooding his pulmonary system, spreading internally to every part of his body in seconds. Unable to breathe or make a sound, Noir was suffering unspeakable agony as the invisible predators began to eat him alive inside and out. Knowing the end was near, he threw himself on the floor, hoping that the sound of the crash would warn his beloved Gale to f flee. But the diabolical murderer was there to hold him and ease his decaying carcass as his decaying carcass gently 
and ease his decaying carcass gently to the ground as his life departed for the frail body for good. Tearing apart cells with insatiable appetite, the nanolicence continued to feast on Noir's corpse, leaving in their wake a sickening ooze of cellular detritus. Tracking the number of seconds since his demise, the broker knelt beside the mess and inserted an electronic device into the jelly-like puddle beneath Noir's clothes. In a muted poof, a stream of electrical current flashed into the carcass, uniformly aligning the microscopic bots in this current field with such force that they behaved like flechettes, shredding the ruined tissue and vaporizing the water that remained. All that remained of Noir's corpse was dust, stench, and dead nanolints, cybernetic implants, and a golden wedding band. The broker worked quickly to clean up the remains off the floor, dumping them into the travel case that Gail, that Gail Noir had left for her husband. Honey, the Navy vehicles are here, she called out. The broker quickly reached inside the case for the wedding band and slid it into the onto his finger. Be right out, dear, he said, slipping on a pair of trousers with the Admiral's dress uniform. What is that horrible smell, she asked, appearing in the doorway. Just something the wind blew in, he said with a smile, nothing more. She smiled at, uh, She stared at him quizzically. Are you all right? I'm fine, he answered. I just need another minute. I'll be right out. Gail took a few steps toward her husband while she continued to get dressed. Are you sure? You seem... I said I'm fine, her husband growled, quickly closing the uh, front of the shirt, and then grabbed several uniforms off the rack uh, and tossed them into the case, activating the seals and heaved it onto the floor. Time to go. He walked right past her without so much of a glance, the travel case obediently following behind his heels, if she wasn't so shocked by his abrupt departure, or the fact that he had never left without kissing her goodbye in the entirety of their lives, she might have noticed the silver of Alex's strange st stained shirt sticking out from the case, the same one he was wearing just ten minutes earlier. Alexander, or Admiral Alexander Noir returned the salute of the Navy officers waiting for him outside, and then slipped into the vehicle without ever looking back. So, yeah. Uh... Alexander Noir, which was a military uh, hero for the Galente, was accused of this and, and is still in universe believed to be uh, having killed himself, suiciding uh, his Nicks into the, uh, the station. He was, he was there as a guard for the, for the operation, by the way. All right. <coughs> Drifters are the other. This isn't even that really um, unusual of a thing. We were talking so in the in Empyrean Age, we find out that inside of the sleeper construct, there's this artificial intelligence that has risen up. Now, in the construct, everyone must have a body if they have a if if they're going to be there. It's called the one body one mind policy. So everybody has to physically exist. But here emerge these these minds without any body. That the, uh, these uh, children um, were shunned by the population originally, but obviously took over and enslaved the sleepers effectively. Um, and these artificial sapiens are known as the other. Now, it has all but been confirmed because it says that the drifters are emerging from the second uh, from the remains of the second uh, or the sleeper civilization. Now. Uh, CCP, when I went to the uh, one of the Eve um, Vegases in the lore panel, I was talking about like how, I, I think it was the one in 2016, I was talking about how this, okay, the Circadian Seekers and the Drifters, and I referred to them as one group, and uh, CCP Affinity was quick to um, point out to me that they are actually two different groups, that the Circadian Seekers, which are more like the Sleepers, are one set of group, one set of you know, one faction, and then the drifters are actually a different faction that they're working together, which makes sense if the drifters are in fact the other. Where if you see in the video that I that I post that they or you know the the song at the beginning and ep end of all, all my episodes, you can see the drifter being pulled out of the sorry not the drifter but the uh, the sleeper being pulled out of the construct and then put onto the slab, and then there's a little needle that goes into the neck, and it kind of jumps a little bit. And I think that that's actually when the other gets inserted into the uh, the drifter. But I digress. Um, well, actually, one more piece to that. When the drifter autop autopsy went came out, one of the biggest things that was pointed out there was that the drifters had no voice box. 
And uh, I've always kind of suspected, like, why would that be? Like, and not not only why would that be, but why would CCP ensure to comment on that? Now, the dr uh, Drifter autopsy report was actually created by Capsuleers, by players. There were real people that are real life, you know, do that kind of thing for real life. And so decided to do one for the Drifters and worked with CCP. And CCP told them that they could, but told them a few details that they had to put in and a few details that they couldn't put in. And one of those was the fact that they have no voice box. So obviously that piece of information is really important, uh, or at least important in some way, not a throwaway, not made up by, ca by, by just the players. So uh, I think that that's because if the sleepers were still there, they might be able to communicate. And so uh, the drifters, or you know, the, the other remove the voice box so that way the sleepers can no longer communicate. The drifters are kind of like Sancha's drones then, Kind of, except for Sanchez drones were all just no. Sanchez drones are people that have been had their brains hijacked by implants. This thing, the other, ha has never been a person. It's not a person. It's closer to like a demon, right? It doesn't exist. It knows it's wrong, and it hates us for it. Uh Now that actually leads into the next two, which is. In Empyrean Age, we find out that Jamil was actually cloned. It, it is not a miracle of God that Jamil was resurrected. In fact, there is a conspiracy to bring her back by a guy named Felix Grange at the Matriarch Citadel. However, during that process, the other managed to infiltrate and uh, intercept and infiltrate that transmission and stitch itself into Jamil's brain. Um, from that point on, she the other was in Jamil's brain. Uh, and that also makes it very interesting that the first thing that the Drifters did was kill Jam uh, Jamil. Um, now, in Inheritance, uh, Venial comments about how, like, or Matashi Reich scanned Jamil and sees that there's the artificial sapient there. Um, and they mention about how they've kind of enmeshed together, um, and they speculate that this is possibly, like, Jamil's way of fighting back in some way. Um, there's actually a really cool story that came out back in the day, like all uh, uh, back then, that both of the versions of this chronicle are actually lost. But I have a section in my lore, um, lore notion called Lost Chronicles. So uh, here is an interesting one where th this this chronicle is called "And I Shall Hide," and it talks. This is like from the perspective J of Jamil. Um, Jamil's character, you know, internal dialogue, right? But there's there's these breaks, right? It goes, you know, Katis offers her something like those Templars you once bragged about, but then swept aside like a failed mistake. They say that the state perfected their own, but hath gone mad and turned against them. I want to laugh at her. Mad? Blank. No, I'm not mad, nor is Heth, not in the slightest. Blank. Heth is finally t trying to reach blah, 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 blah. Well, then a little bit later, they came out with a second version of the Chronicle called And I Shall Hide Alternate. And what we can see here is all of those spaces. See that? All of those spaces get filled in as we now can see the other's messages to her. So she says, yes, when I was a naive girl, no, when I was a cynical woman. Now, uh, who else but God could inflict such a curse on me? Who else but God could? It had been uh, told before, told me that we are God before us. There was no God, but now there is one. I think we might be the devil. My legacy will meet the deceiver and the mad emperor once I am dead. And the other says to her, your legacy, if left to your own devices, will be a brief period as a writhing mass full of delighted little gobbing things, followed by an eternity of, of a pile of dust and little else. Don't romanticize yourself. Your doubts are as pointless as your fantasies of death, all of which prove only that you're still alive and perfectly capable of thinking. We won't die for a while yet. And she responds, oh yes, we shall one day. Blah, 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 blah. And uh, he re refers to her delusions, tells her to accept my ideas, reach out and they're yours, all of them. Together we shall be so much more than even your greatest dreams. Um... And she says, far from, uh, it is not what I once imagined as a little girl dreaming of becoming an empress. You put yourself here. You continue to fight against, against me. Your continued fight against me is accomplishing nothing except widening the cracks in your psyche. 
Embrace me. Accept me. We will turn the, uh, the world on its head. The greatest empire emperors of your race will be brushed away as false idols. Their statutes and monuments left to rot in the seasons. This bed isn't for you, and you needn't sleep in it. So you can tell, like, he's, like, psychological tor manipulation, uh, abuse tactics, like, left and right, right? Just, just picking away at her, uh, trying to make her feel weak, and that he, she must believe in him and turn to him. So, uh, later on, we get, um, so they're all talking. She meets with the different uh, heirs. And we see, like, they're kind of getting on to her. See, she goes, my contacts in the state have been whispering to me, something of those Templars you once bragged about, but then swept aside like a failed mistake. They say the state perfected their own, but Heth has gone mad and turned against them. I want to laugh at her. Mad? And then he says, you're the expert on the subject, certainly. Your madness in... Your madness is in your incompetence and fear. It is in turning down the gifts I try to give you. No wonder you're despairing. despairing. And she goes, no, I'm not mad, nor is health hath not in the slightest. And then the other says, if you desire it so much, mind, we will find a way to drive you to, uh, to it. Have you ever wondered what drove Karsoth? I can make his delights seem quaint if you want. Karsoth was the, um, the, like, the super corrupt, um, very vile... Uh, Chamberlain that tried to take over the Amar before Jamil. Oh, just give voice to the wish and we will drive, dive into the maelstrom. So, uh, things kind of actually turn bad, especially when, uh, the, the, the Conid, King Conid comes in. Um, you know, you decide to throw away such a weapon while all of our enemies have it, he shouts. Are you going to tell me that ne next, the Sabic have two, the Sandra? They're talking about the, the, the empires and their clone war soldiers, right? They're, they're, their worry is that now the other empires are getting clone soldiers, and Jamil has ordered the destruction of the Templars um, because they're, the, you know, they're infected by the other. Um, and so they're kind of, like, mad about that and, like, trying to figure it out. And so he goes... Um, do you think he is acting, or do you think he actually don't realize it? I believe he must not have realized. Ar Giannis Ardeshaper is many things, but an actor he is not. His outrage is genuine. So this, while it seemed like she was talking to herself originally, is actually a response to the other. And what of the others? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, <coughs> and he goes, I, I think that you are probably right. And Conid, who knows what he... Jonas's rant is cut off by Conid's deep, booming laugh. It's because they're all demons, he said. My breath catches in my throat. So Conan directly declares that the cap that the uh, clone soldiers were demons. Uh, Jonas only spares Conan a brief disgust glance. You senile miscreant. Jonas snap, and he goes senile. Why, my boy? I feel like I was just born yesterday. Uh, which we'll get to that in a in a little bit. Um, a few times he joked that he'd been granted divine youth, always with a twinkling. Smirk, staunched, gr uh, scrunched glance at me. Uh, put a pin in that. Uh, so he goes, it's true, though, Kana said. They were possessed by demons. She, unle she unleashed Moloch upon the cluster. Isn't that true, Empress? Dare you tell the truth? You've done so much to cover up your failures. Dare you admit to them that you're not the perfect Empress you tried to make yourself out to be, but rather an infested vessel co covered in a flesh coat of paint? It seems that Conan knows everything. Is that why the mere thought of him being here made your insights turn? He knows more than anyone else here. Maybe even you. He's the one that the Empire should be leading it, not a coward. What, what's to stop him from simply telling them everything? Why should you choose them? Uh, she goes, if Conan wanted to tell him, them everything, he would have already. He might not even know at all. He could simply be buff bluffing to see what I will say. I must choose my words carefully. Um, and so she does, she says, it's true, in less majestic terms, our Templar project has developed these in immortal soldiers based on the technology recovered from Anoikis, but there was a flaw in them which made them dangerous. We could not control them, so we eradicated them and started anew using technologies not t tied to the sleepers. But it was too late. The other empires have already begun their own programs. 
The Caldari are now reaping the fruits of these programs and is ripping this, their state asunder. Uh, and you dare keep this from us? For how long? Blah, blah, blah. And so they, they basically all get mad, right? Um, these are the actions that would doom the Empire. The heirs should have known about this project from the very outset. Father, screaming, mother, powerless, girl runs, weeping, a find a place to hide. So this idea of find a place to hide kind of comes up throughout this chronicle. Um, but this is like her breaking down, right? My hands are quivering beneath my robe I, with slick with sweat. No longer was touch required to set memories flowing. The words come uh, so unbidden I nearly choke. Enough! You've be you behave... Sorry, you believe you have power here, but you speak only because I allow it. You think me weak, but I am strength beyond your kin. Now silence your pointless prattling and let me speak without interrupting. I will not have my work undone due to your self-righteous pettiness. The Kaldari are destroying their soldiers now, which leaves our only, en uh, only our enemies with them. But I've already laid plans to deal with that. The Mimitar shall be next, surely. The Galente soon after. They shall run down the ta tainted soldiers and, for the most part, eradicate them. A few may escape their grasp. I know this to be true, because a few already have. My insides shake, wondering just how many had. Would it be too many? A single ember can start a new flame. Don't you see? If you struggle, you failed before you've already begun. There is nothing you can do to stop it. I've already won. If you would accept that, it could be us who won. Stop being so stubborn. Shut up. You don't control me as much as you claimed. You are quite right, of course. A fear grips me. I control you even more than that. Um, this time, none, of my, uh, no, none question my lapse into silence. I lick my lips and continue. The Kaldari have made a mess of their purge. It's too public. Too many people are asking questions. The others may have to try to hide their actions, but it will not succeed. Soon, their entire world will know about these immortal soldiers. People will learn of the dangers that they pose and hate them more than they even hate the Capsuleers. Only the Empire, where the, we kept our failures hidden, shall the sane not be seen as monsters. And what then, Empress? asked Uriam, Uriam Kador, speaking for the first time, his voice cool. I shall give them a home, and I shall hide. So, uh, yeah. The other. Spooky stuff related to the shooter. Isogen 5 caches. Um, Isogen 5 caches are, we talked about this before. Basically, um, they, they're talked about in Templar 1, but there is a series of structures that were built by um, the ancient races that they call the Terrans. Um, and that were automated by rogue drones that collected, or sorry, automated by drones that collected Isogen 5, which is this rare volatile MacGuffin material. And it was one of those caches that set off the detonation, which caused the, uh, the, um, the Apocrypha event, where 10 of those Isogen 5 caches exploded, ca causing an interaction with the star, blowing up the first moon, blah, 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 blah. Zoria Triglov is the detached executive troika. I mostly just kind of wanted to throw this on there. Um, so in a lot of the stuff in the um, in their records, they refer to the detached executive troika for the sublimation of Poshloss flow, and of course during the invasions we see Zoria Triglov. Um, now we know that uh, the detached executive troika for the sublimation of Poshloss flow comes from, or no, sorry, Zoria Triglov uh, claims to be an emanation of the three tr uh, cl clades, which is why she has the last name Troika or is Triglov. So either way, long story short, hey, thanks V Rod. Long story short, I asked um, uh, Delegate Zero about this, and he confirmed that Zoria Triglov is, in fact, the detached executive troika for the sublimation of Poshloss Low. Federal POW camps. Uh, Lorelite asked me to put this on here. I still don't know exactly how big of a thing it is, but uh, there is a thing. There is an item uh, called the Kaldari Prisoner of War. All of these Kaldari POWs show the signs of appalling treatment over an extended period of time. Even the most well-off are still suffering from starvation and serious malnourishment. The worst of them are barely alive after enduring sleep deprivation, physical abuse, and other more excessive forms of torture. The women in particular have not fared well under the Galente jail masters who have remorselessly, remorselessly taken whatever they desire from their captured prey. Did you not... Are you not the one that did that? Yeah, you did. Because I even asked you, I thought I asked you about it and you told me the, the link. 
Were you not the one that originally asked me for it? I, I apologize. Okay. I, I messaged you to, to get the, whether or not it meant anything, because I thought you were the one that originally told me about it. Okay, well, either way, if, if somebody does know about it, or was the person, please comment below, and we'll, uh, we'll track this down. But yeah, it's just, uh, there is actually a series of chronicles called Methods of Torture, which are actually terrible, and I probably will not do a reading of. But, you know, you can read it if you want to lose faith in humanity. <coughs> you have any concerns about whether or not there's any good guys in Eve, read those chronicles. All right, Sky, Muster, uh, Sky Mother and Thucker City Ships. In, I think it was this version, this one, right? No, no, yes. So around the time of the tax changes in 2019, uh, YC-121, we see this report. Thucker tribe deny claims of militarized city ship project hidden in drone regions. So this is pretty weird, especially since this is around the time of like the world arcs and stuff like that. Um, but then also, hold on. Sky Mother. Uh, yeah, Project Sky Mother was undertaken by the Mimitar Corporation Core uh, Complexion Incorporated with assistance of Six Skin Development to develop a new ship-based ancient technology researched by uh, and his team during the Charon lifetime. The ship developed it's is of unknown classification contains jump drives and was of such size that only a small portion of it could be viewed at a time from a shuttle viewport um and it's talked about in this chronicle which we may need to visit more deeply at some point and see whether or not there's anything more about it uh 514 so dust 514 a lot of people ask, like, oh, what does 514 stand for? And some people say, oh, well, it's because it came out on 514, right? January, March, May 14th. Um, and the problem is, is that that's not why. <laughs> and I know that that's not why, because there's a chronicle, which is another one of those lost chronicles, called 514, right? So this chronicle called 514 is about the four other empire, or well, the three other empires and their development of clone soldiers, right? So we see, uh, you know, stuff with Sh uh, Shakur, Jamil is here, Rodin is here, like the whole gang's here, right? Well, they're they're comparing notes about their uh, clone soldiers, right? And in this part, they go, you know. In the eyes of God in the throne, uh, blah, 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 blah. Samatar said the empress, raising her powerful voice so that it sounded like, uh, resounded off the ch small chamber's walls. Having so recently gained your freedom, I would think that you of all people would not wish to see the others enslaved. I started the Templar project because this, w this war had seen too many lives lost. I wanted a swift end to it, and gaining this technology was a means to that end. You wanted to win the war, not end it, corrected Rodin. In the eyes of God in the throne, those terms are one and the same, Mr. President. You understand enough to know about us to know that much. Her syllables were coming faster now, rapid fire, words tumbling ov over each other as her voice gained momentum. So probably being controlled by the other. The things I speak of here today are not important. Do you attempt to smother, or she's trying to not be controlled by the other. Do you not attempt to smother them with, your, with petty semantics? Rodin... With, uh, gave a small flourish. Continue then. Sorum was pensive for a moment, seated at the table in regal diplomatic posture, her hands forming a single, tr a small triangle on the edge of the table. She cleared her throat. Her cheeks looked sunken and so uh, sallow. Droplets of sweat peer pearled on her forehead. If you don't believe me, she said presently, then answer me this. Has the number 514 played into any of your lost cases? The atmosphere in the room sharpened perceptively. Heth leaned back in his chair and crossed his arms. At length, he began to speak. It's been happening since the beginning, he said. At first, we thought the lo it was localized to a particular pace. Our first two cases came from the same barracks. We thought it was something a few of them had seen on joint operations, some kind of graffiti they'd seen during a traumatic moment on Kaldari Prime. Sorum was staring at him intently. Then it started popping up everywhere, Heth continued. Always the same. Blood-red skies... Strange beings, 
and the number 514, often written in blood, said Shakur. Heth looked at him, eyebrows raised. Rodin showed no expression, but his eyes darted back and forth between the two men. Exactly that, said Heth. Empress Sorum no nodded. Before that moment, uh, before that moment and all its implications were allowed to go any further, Rodin sp spoke. What does this prove, though? I beg your pardon, Mr. President? The implants give them strange visions. How do we know for sure that the sleeper consciousness is the culprit, not some random subroutine implanted as a failsafe in their engineers? For that matter, how do you know this isn't merely a quirk of so on and so forth? So the issue is, is that we don't actually know why it's called 514. Now, I have a buddy who claims to know and claims to not be telling me. And I'm mad at him. And he's enjoying himself right now. And we're going to move on. Venial. I honestly do not know why I put Venial this low down the thing. Venial is the uh, the Jovian that's like the head of the Society of Conscious Thought. And he's the one that gives, uh, that's talking to Matashi Reich in, during Inheritance. Uh, and kind of is the, the last representative of the Jove that we ever hear from. Uh, but that's it for this layer. So let's go deeper. We've still got time. All right, Anayana Kori is the Deathless. Uh, we talked. I've talked about this before, so uh, we, I've referred to stuff earlier. Basically, uh, to summarize, Anayana Kori is this uh, guy called the Fiend, whose family was killed by sorrow, um, like twenty, thirty years ago. Now, the Fiend is a terrorist, and he is like he does internet. He has an international kind of or um, underground kind of like network and the assassin in uh, sine wave alpha and omega sakuni is operating with anakori's men so anakori is active in the modern day even though all of the information about the fiend was back in back before then so uh around that same time emerges the deathless who has hey you must find answers answers in the dust oh my god Thanks for that punch. Uh, maybe it's a full of code necessary for fulcrum or clone activation. That would be the long game, wouldn't it? No. So uh, basically, my theory is that Ani Anakori, the fiend, who goes by many names, he says, at some point, especially after Darkness Visible and Offspring Cephas, started working together with other to kind of bring together as many of the pirate groups as possible um and uh was contracting with mercenaries and became what we now know as the deathless right so uh the one of my reasons for this is the deathless's main target has been concord specifically sorrow which is on iana cory's uh, technique Anayana Kori is based, like, is a terrorist and also, like, like I said, he's, he's kind of this underground agent that has also disappeared. Um, and likewise, like, I think that it could be explained why uh, the Deathless snubbed the Serpentis at first, because Anayana Kori also doesn't trust or like pharmaceutical companies, uh, because he was, they were uh, protesting a pharmaceutical thing uh, when it all went down. All right. Next. I have a, I have a, I have videos about the Deathless and and whatnot to to watch as well. Conid the Third is a clone, so this is actually a very common one. Um, so Conid the Second, right? Um, so Conid was supposed to commit uh, ritual suicide. Uh, Conid the Second was supposed to commit ritual suicide when he lost, but he decided not to and rebelled and went to war until he established the kind of kingdom as a, a separate right <clears throat> but we have this note here that it says despite his advanced age kind of the second remains in a fairly healthy and publicly appears to be relatively youthful remember he comments about all of that stuff about how youthful he feels and all that stuff in that chronicle um though it has never been publicly acknowledged rumors claim that kind of the second has abandoned the press at of sacred flesh and has undergone therapeutic cloning to extend his youth. How much of this rumor is truth and how much of it can be attributed to the leg legendary longevity of the Conid heirs is up to debate. So 
there's there's already me- lots and lots of sp- speculation that Conan the Second was cloning himself. So here we see somebody on the Intergalactic Summit talking about things in 2019, and she says, Conan shows he's more than willing to go it alone. He's capable of going it alone. He's the military economics. Uh, blah 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 blah. Hold on. Um, Yeah, at the bottom, she says, so the Empire isn't going to push it because they can't really afford to do so, uh, to be shown as a paper tiger again, and they can't afford a civil war. And he, because we all know Conan the Third is yet another Conan the Second clone. So the, the, the conspiracy theory is that Conan the Second was willing to go d- take part in the succession trials and then eventually get killed in, this, in the Rite of Shafel Sin with the assumption of power by Katis Tashmurkon. Uh, because he had see, actually cloned himself, and so he is his own heir. That's the theory. Highland Tukas is alive. So uh, we have this, which is the last message of Highland Tukas. This disturbing recording was recently acquired by The Scope. And despite DED protests, we believe that the public has the right to know. What he's saying is, this is Highland Tukas on, of the ship codename, uh, or whatever, name Air Ar- Jalan. I'm in a previously unknown period of uh, area of space. There's a massive structure and more and more, or increasing number of drifters. Uh, what does he say? More and more. As long as we can. Notify oh, I'll maintain signal as long as I can. Notify the DED. Notify the DED. We may be facing a possible major in... We may be praising more the and more have been arriving at this enormous structure. Detected. More and more ships have been arriving at this enormous structure. And it is possible that detected. It is possible. More and more have been arriving at this enormous structure. Detected and and it is possible that things have. If it is possible, something. Right. Okay. So that is the last message from Highland Tukas. However, it is believed that this was confer- uh, uh, that this message was sent out before the like the message that we got from him on the forums. So once again, we go to another post by Uriel. What is the true legacy of Highland Tukas? So um, this is Uriel's theory, and you know. We can talk about it some other time, but he summarizes it very good, and I like it. So here's the here's the top level summary: Doctor Highland Tukas, arriving in the Aram system in the control of a sleeper drifter vessel and carrying vital information, was intercepted by agents of Eifer and Co. a short time after broadcasting his final transmission outside the Eifer station on Feb- late February YC one seventeen and spirited away, never being encountered at his destination site one. His corporate citizenship was then nullified, making him a non-citizen with no human rights in order to legally extract or utilize whatever information Tukas had brought with him in whatever form he had taken by any means necessary. When the doctor's body was discovered in readout, the DED relentlessly pursued the possession, the possessing samples in order to officially declare his death and permit Eifer and Co. to execute his will. Eifer went on, then went on to become a founding member of the Upwell Consortium, which makes full use of information provided by the officially dead citizen of nowhere Highland Tukas in developing their proprietary stand-up nano assembly system and the now ubiquitous upwell structures and models modules marketed to capsuleers as they vie for ever-growing influence on the stage of New Eden. So basically, there was a, a communication by ta- Tukas where it's all terribly encoded, um, and there's these different mess like breaks in the messages and. But people went in and cracked the code. Um, Highland Tukas is the founder of the Eric Jalan project, which was like an attempt to get um, 
you know, between in-universe like NPCs and players to understand Anoikis wormhole space. But um, the doctor's message stated that the resource drop would soon be established. Hold on. The message contained various hexadecimal strings denoted syntax determinations, not characteristics of human communications, along with inv inv invitation to begin the collection of Jove biomass samples sourced it from the YC-106 incident. Uh, the doctor's message stated that the resource drop would be established in the Aram Site 1, that headquarters of the Eric Jalan project, Tuka stated for, for some time he'd been unable to communicate, but had remained dedicated to the research that we began together in right conflict date, current equals 24, 10, 116, replace string 9, 7, 113, YC 113. So we see like they're correcting the time, the, the message in real time. A second message is equally rife with hexadecimals. And you can see, like, this guy's broken it. It goes, system initializing, checksum complete, consoles online, decrypting broadcast, 1936, 68, 88, 91, complete, aligning receiver node, complete, commencing broadcast. Good evening, capsuleers. Thank you for your syntax error. Search heated, synonym, result, warm. Warm reception since my last contact. I'm happy to inform you that, uh, the, that a resource drop has been successfully set up in Site 1 in order to accept the syntax error. Search aforementioned, synonym, result, previously. Previously mentioned materials. I have very look, looks very similar to like the way that Triglavian's computing system works. Not that I'm saying that they're the same, but like Triglavians are related to Jovians, but uh, it, it's, it's, it's interesting. I have watched with admiration as you have taken to Anoikis with particular interest paid to the colonization of configuration error. Search. These are colony, the, so these are wormhole signatures. One, two, three, four, five. I think that those are the th five drifter wormholes. Once initial work has been completed, I can return to full time to assisting and curating the projects you have so generously contributed over the past years. Your contribution to the project so far has broadcast corruption detected pass packet blah, blah, blah. So remember, uh, like it was determined afterwards that this message was, uh, Oh yeah, so that's these this hexadecimal encoded, okay? And so wait. Oh, no, no, no. This is this is his first message. My bad. And we can see um Yeah, we, likewise, we can see here, system initializing, check some complete console online, decrypting broadcasts, um, syntax error, syntax error, search healthy synonym, result well, because he says, you know, um, gosh, he, he leaves out the, the words in between. Does somebody else do it? Anyway, so we see the same kind of corruption here, right? Um, Then, uh, in November, on the November 12th, so eight days later, many after many capsuleers had obediently journeyed to Aram in order to deposit Jove biomass, a very different third message appears on the summit. This communication was broken up by vaguely decipherable and apparently appeared to be warm recipients that Tukas had, had been, or to warn, warn recipients that Tukas had been captured in some way and was being held somewhere in Nanoikis and that Site 1 was compromised. So let's look at that. Oh, hold on. Attempted reconstruction of third message. That's probably better. Uh, so, oh, let's actually look at the message too. So this is the original form of the third message. We can see some of the same stuff. Um, yeah, but not quite the same. And then there's all these, and then there's this message. So... Somebody went through and tried to piece together what he what they probably were saying. And so they get, this is the first transmission I have been able to make in some time. This is Highland Tukas, broadcasting on low band emergency FTL. I am unsure of the exact frequency. Site 1 is compromised. All staff involved in the Eric Jalan project should be considered insecure and should abandon any equipment therein, uh, Sorry, and should abandon any equipment 
therein considered it contaminated. Disregard the previous communications from what appears to be my neocom. Their intent is misdirection on the part of those who have me restrained. DT cooperated with that with them in all classes. I have attempted to make contact with Eifer and Co. to no avail or in order to relay details of my situation. It is my last hope that this transmission will be picked up by the FTL network and broadcasted to the pertinent places. I am currently held against my will. My captors are unknown, uh, but from the new few details of my surroundings, I have been able to ascertain I am being held somewhere in Anoikis. The available data that I could gather would suggest somewhere close to proximity of a wolf rat given luminosity and gravity uh, signatures. I think that that's where they found his body. It is imperative the capsular task. It is imperative. Yeah, it is imperative the capsular task force dedicated to Erchelon continue their work in my absence. Without my presence, the project must continue to advance with recent information you've received. I believe my captors to be sleep uh, uh, something. Ending in an S. Fearful of the event now transpiring and are in a state of panic. I implore you. Um, all to continue to further the aims of the Eric Jalon project and to continue the work on uh, and to continue to work on a solution. The fate of the project is now in your hands, and if there is any chance of communication, my escape in the future, I will, I shall endeavor to do so. Uh, and then do don't do not search for me, as the danger is far too great. So, yeah. That's uh, that's what's going on with Eifer and Co. Or that's what happened to Highland Tukas and Eifer and Co. The time base experiments and the Triglavians. Okay, so when the time base experiment happened, there was basically, okay, uh, I think it was 2018, 2019, the new year. Uh, there was this big ex uh, time base Thing that was done by um, Concord, it was like to to synchronize the clocks, and this m mysterious guy called um, the astrologer, something weird like that, that we believe might be connected to. Um, there's this weird argument about how time should be tracked in Eve, like in universe argument, and so there's like these. 20 i have a whole video about it but suffice it to say it was very unusual but then after that uh the soe splinter group uh the pharaohs of thera which we've heard about quite a bit in the previous episodes claims a conspiracy to carry out a bizarre experiment in public space lanes the sister of eve splinter group pharaohs of thera have been in exclusive contact with the scope collab speaking of the right gloriax pharaohs of thera spokesman jora alexis so remember by this point um taya akira is gone Claim that a covert unit of Concord's Sorrow Black Ops Division orchestrated a complex plan to entice drifters into a situation where, quote, advanced anti-drifter countermeasures could be deployed. The story is was uh, that this was a simple time-based measuring mission is just a cover for the real plan involving covert assets from Sorrow and probably even Algental Corps, who, after all, were also there in force. Ever since the disappearance of Taiakira during the ro ro Rogue Swarm Alert, We've been seeing even more signs of experimental operations carried out by the DED and especially the Sorrow. The former uh, sister, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, that's just saying that she was the presumed leader. Jora Alexis claims that Sorrow has expanded over the last few years uh, into a covert intelligence and black ops section within Concord. As the Ferris Othera spokesman put it, quote, they're, they specialize in developing advanced weapons from ancient technology, eliminating AI researchers and sci sabotaging scientific inquiry that might threaten Concord's world or order. They certain, we're certain that they are behind the dis disappearance of Taya Akira. So here's the thing. Shortly after the time base experiment occurred, like this is 2018-0109. And real quick, this is 
this was this is April 27th. Wait. Hold on. Wouldn't it be neat if I debunked my own thing live? No. Yeah. So in January of 2018, uh, they call it a, so the, like at the end of the year of 2017, that's what it was. At the end of 2017, uh, the, they do this time-based mission. Uh, in, at the beginning of 2018, Ferris Athera come out and say that it was like, you know, this cover-up. Uh, and then April, so three months, th four months later, uh, the first Triglavian is discovered. These recordings released by Concord show the capture of a heavily damaged ship found drifting a few days ago in the system of Rainilles. No information has been released on the whereabouts or the fate of its crew, but within hours of being boarded, the ship was towed to the Concord Directive Enforcement Department headquarters in July. There it remained quarantined outside the station for 48 hours before it was deemed safe to dock. Little is known about the crew or the builders of the ship at this time except the name Yeah. Oh. In Triglavian, possibly connected to the frequent occurrence of the number three in their designs. For the past month, damaged drifter fleets have been mysteriously emerging around I didn't know you can click and hold and make it Eden. fast forward. Appearing in previously oh, unseen numbers, the right these That's drifter cool. fleets have been nicknamed Death Balls by Capsuleers. Pa okay, so... Basically, um, the idea is, is that we know that the Triglavians don't like the Drifters. And so the question is, could the time base experiment had been the thing that triggered the Triglavians to be able to come into our world? Could the time base experiment had been a coordinated effort in order to make space time, like put out a signal that the Triglavians could lock onto, for example, or, or whatever? Um, you know, could this be part of the conspiracy? Could the, w could it be possible that Sorrow were aware of the Triglavians and thought to use them as a weapon against the Drifters? Because, like, immediately after this, we do see Drifter Death Balls being taken out by the Triglavians. It's almost as if this event was what thinned the boundaries. Uh, that said, it does make it really odd because the Rogue Swarm was before that. So obviously the, the, the Rogue Drones that potentially were connected to the Drigalavians had been in and out before. But, um, it, like, I do have this theory where, like, there could be a connection between Tyakira, the Rogue Drones, and the Triglavians, uh, and Concord, where basically the Rogue Drones discovered a way out of the Trigla uh, out of the Abyss, or, sorry, a way into the Abyss, and in order to kind of sync up to be able to create their filaments that they end up using... That's what triggers the. That's what the time based experiment was effectively for. Was to um, allow them to uh, like perform these new filament connections, some way or another. And so, um, yeah, the the tri the rogue drones could know about the Triglavians. Tyakira was taken by a rogue drone, and accused of taken by Concord. So then Concord turns around and does an experiment that then makes the Triglavians show up. That, there you go. That's, that's, there we go. And with all that said, let's go even deeper. All right. Echoverse. Uh, so the Echoverse, I'm actually going to just um, steal a little bit of this guy's video. I'm going to give you, give him credit. Okay. This is, uh, Eve Echo Chamber. He doesn't have enough subscribers, so please, everybody, go there and check it out. In fact, hold on, let me. I'm going to make sure I put that in my description. All right. So. The event described here is known in Eve Online as lie in the path of the supernova as you are ignoring my advice and afk mining in losec read learn enjoy 
the so this is that lore book that I was talking about earlier. Our ancestry, and it's called Eve Echoes. It reads, in YC-116, W-577P, a huge star in a constellation neighboring New Eden, went supernova, releasing a surge of power immense enough to affect multiple galaxies. Fortunately, New Eden did not lie in the path of the supernova's jets, and was spared the worst of the destruction. But the tremendous energy involved catalyzed a ripple in the fabric of the universe itself, triggering the separation of a new sub-universe from New Eden, which continues to expand and evolve. This is how the Echo's parallel universe was born. The event described... So yeah, there you go. Um... The event that we know of as Caroline Star, W477 Tac P, actually split off a parallel reality. There's also a like a weird thing where there's like a crack. Um kash and there's a word like Kashoi. And there's other stuff too, but the uh, the Echoes plot hasn't really gone in that direction. So um they've definitely set it up where they could do like say a crossover event if for some reason we managed to figure out a way to <coughs> do a crossover um but yeah now for the section that i like to call who are the triglavians all right uh we have people that believe that the triglavians are the adheduani that the adheduani as we know it were actually um like because the Adheduani, when they show up, are... Well, actually, no, because they only uh, do voices or whatever. So um, the idea here is, is that the Triglavians were actually... There are some people that believe that the Triglavians were not trapped in, uh, in the Abyss totally. That they had abilities to observe, monitor, or even have agents in the real world. And so one of the ideas is that the Adhed Yuani is a cover from the Triglavians as they manipulated the universe. I think that this one has largely been debunked, um, but it, it, it exists. The Triglavians are the Talican. Uh, that's the one that I... Uh... No, no, no. Uh, uh... CCP has said that alternate universes does exist canonically. If you go watch my interview with uh, CCP Fozzie, he talks about that. Um, yeah. So, Triglavians are the Talican. So, the T Talican are the guys who made uh, Anoikis. They are the creators of the Dyson Swarm around W477 Tac P. Uh, they were masters of maybe i yeah i don't know i know that they've made sure that it's um okay i'll i'll say this they've made sure that they've insulated eve online from eve echoes and even back when they first came out with eve echoes they they outright said that like they kind of set the table to make it so that they can merge the universe in some way if they wanted to um, and remember, this is all when they're thinking about multidimensionality and all that kind of stuff. So, um, I think that they've intentionally left it so that at any time they could just make it work, you know, especially with the Yan Yung showing up in, uh, Echo's verse, but they've clearly opted to not proceed with that. And therefore those little hooks are left kind of out there that's what i believe all right but what else i believe is the triglavians are the talican i have a video about this in my tinfoil or my uh i figured out the eve lore video which is much longer or not actually that's that's not even true uh but the point is is that the talican were in uh were in conflict with um somebody it would seem they were also like they're the ones that had a quarantine uh, due to some sort of virus. And so the idea is, is that, like, uh, also in the Echoes, it says that the Sleepers were actually created by the Talican, that that the, the Jovians that were in the construct, basically, like, they had already created the construct, but the actual biological manipulation, the, the removing of the lobe and putting in the, or sorry, the adding of the lobe and making it 
me mechanical so that way they can hook into the construct and all that stuff was actually done by the Talican. Um, this is what's accused in Echoes, although we don't have any evidence of that in Eve itself. Um, however, the idea being is, is that like in Eve, we see that reference to the Jovian Triglavian satellite polity. So uh, there is an idea. I don't know if it goes even further, but like in my, I figured out the Eve universe thing. Um, Actually, no, we get into it with uh, Yan Yung versus the Talican down here. But the idea is that, like, back in the day, there was a war. Or, like, in the beginning, there was a war between the Yan Yung and the Talican. The Talican went to Anoika space. Yan Yung mastered gravitonic energy and, and Isogen 5 and built the caches. Uh, and then the Yan Yung unleashed an, a virus, which is why uh, the Talican, like a computer virus, which is why the Talican systems are designed to not be able to be operated unless you're a physical human being. Um, and this causes the AI war, which is also referred to in Echoes, but not directly referred to in Eve, which is where the Talican basically have to kill off a whole bunch of the sleepers because they become infected, uh, which kind of tracks with that whole like Sancha thing where it's like, oh, you know, purging the corrupt and, uh, you know, all that stuff when it, when it comes to how to deal with Sancha this is why I believe that these are related, right? Those two things, the fact that the Triglavians refer to that satellite polity and what happens to it, and the fact that Echoes refers to the relationship between the Talican and the Jovians. Um, and, you know, as we listen to the story of the Drifter, or from the, of the Jove by Grius earlier, we got to remember that Grius originally, in the original one, Grius uh, uh, was against the Enhiwani, Enhiwani, and then now his spirit, his AI embodiment, is promoting the Enhiwani and, and referring to them as like heroes or whatever. And so that's a little bit odd. I think that that's a really clear sign that this is an unreliable narrator. And therefore, the history of the, of the Enhiwani and the Jovians can be confused. This is actually down here with the Enhiwani lied about the elders. So we got to understand that it's very possible that some of the understandings that we have of the First and Second Jovian Empire may be just flat out wrong. All right. Next. Uh, Akira is rescued by the Triglavians. We talked about that. The Sephirim were Triglavians. Again, so if you go into the Talrog, the Sephirim, and the, uh, the, uh, the Hedewani video that I have, we talk about the, the Sephirim, which is like, so there's these white beings of light that just keep showing up, right? There's the Mimitar Elders, there's the Sephirim to the Amar, and all this stuff. So uh, there's, I have a theory that the Hedewani attempted to manipulate the Amar through the uh, Sephirim, Sephirim, but were rejected by the Amar. Um, and so they presented themselves to the Mimitar and, uh, you know, took over as basically the elders. And then that's why when the Amar took it over, it was so disruptive to them that they called in the Jove to go kill the Amar, or at least stop the Amar. Uh, that said, just like there's belief that the Triglavians are the Ahedjuani, Anytime that there's a disembodied pe thing, people think that it's maybe the Triglavians. Maybe they've astrally projected, you know, not astrally projected, but projected themselves somehow out of the abyss in their earlier days. Next. Okay. Now. Why is there always white being of the light? Like I said, check out that video. My theory is that they're all one thing. That it, the Hedewani figured out how to basically uh, ascend a la Stargate and has been trying to manipulate things ever since. Okay, now we are in full-blown crazy sauce territory, okay? These are, these are, these are the wild, like, these are the, 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 like, absolute speculations or conclusions, right? Or at least we're getting there. The very tip of those. First, Jamil is a drifter queen, is the drifter queen. This is a fun theory that, well, if Highland Tukas got killed, but when he gets killed by the Triglavian, or by the drifters, they kidnap his infomorph. Then, what happened? What happened when Jamil was killed? Why wouldn't they have captured Jamil's consciousness? And so there's this idea that like Jamil will one day emerge as like the Kerrigan of the Drifters and like be the commander as she takes over the Drifters now that she has been had her consciousness uh, gone in. So that's a fun one. So the next one is that uh, is the speculation that Zoria is um is 
Acacia Valkanir, the head of Edencom. This is another fun one because it kind of doesn't really have any foundations on anything. Is slightly racist because it just means that, oh, they have the same accent. It comes down to it. But really the idea is that the argument is, is that the female voice as part of the uh, Zoria triad sounds a lot like Kashia Valkanir, the head of Edencom. Uh, so let's let's listen to this real quick. We speak for the, we speak for the communication of the rivers outside the struggle. We are an emanation of the clades. We are an emanation of the clades of Perun, Velis, and Svarog. So do you hear that accent? You see that way that she she speaks with like slight rolling of the R's and you know whatever. Here is, uh, um. Kasia Valkanir. Months we have been facing, together, a threat of vast proportions. Make no mistake, this threat comes in the form of an enemy that is fierce, ruthless, and devious. The threat is most certainly real and dire. However, there is hope and a plan to resist the invaders. As I speak to you. Hear the words of our prayer. Hear the words of our prayer. And heed them. And heed them. I don't hear it. Maybe you do. Just because uh, the, the trigs are very Slavic. Yes, they, they are absolutely Slavic. There's actually no... Interestingly enough, there is no uh, evidence of any Spanish or Hispanic culture in New Eden. Uh, all right. The Hediwani lied about the elders. So... In the uh, in the Jovian lore, it says that the first the the original argument on when how the first Jovian Empire or rather, the the official story on how the first Jovian Empire collapsed was that the elders um, took over. Now the elders were a branch of statics. Now the Jovians are basically ideologically split into statics and modifiers. Statics believe that they should stop mutating themselves. Modifiers believe that they should continue experimentations, continue modifications, continue um, you know, manipulating their genome, etc. So the elders are a special branch of statics that um, used technology to extend their life to extreme measures, right? So rather than cloning themselves, like a lot of them did, they instead just made it so that they never died. Now, when they take over the, the Jovian Empire, they basically try to suppress all further development of biological development of the Jovian race. And this causes the schism that ends up shattering the first Jovian Empire, okay? So, based on what we already know about the Inheduani and Grius, the theory is here that the Adheduani effectively lied about themselves um, and either are the elders or have basically inserted themselves into the story, right? Making a modification where the Adheduani are the heroes um, and putting them, because if you think about it, like the elders are uh, they used implants to lengthen their time uh, their lifespan this would have been necessary potentially for the crew because they weren't in suspended animation so it's very likely that during the time of their transportation the uh the the the, the pilots the adheduani as they are called by grius uh end up learning uh, using technology to further and further extend their own lifespan turning them into the elders who later on caused the collapse of the first Jovian Empire. There you go. And then Yan Yung versus the Talakan. Like I said, so the Jovian Empire was too, way too young at the very, this first time. So in the earliest days of, the, of uh, New Eden, like before the Eve Gate collapsed and shortly thereafter, it would seem as if there were two major powers in New Eden. There was the Yan Yong and the Talakan. And so, as I mentioned earlier, I suspect that there was a war and we kind of live in the remains of that war that happened, was it 14,000 years ago or something like that? 
uh, because it also the the lore does specify that for some reason the the uh, the it seems like these ancient races all disappeared at the same time period. It would seem that the sleeper or sorry the um, the Talakan and the Yanyong disappeared at the same time. Now I don't have this here, but this is part of the Echoverse thing. But there's a one of the theories that I have is that. I think that the Yanyong, where the Talakan discovered a way to go into Abyssal Dead Space to escape, the Yanyong actually discovered how to transport themselves into parallel realities, which is why the Yanyong show up in Echoes. But we have not yet heard from the Yanyong in our space. All we know is that they're masters of gravitonic energy and lived in uh, what is now Galente Space. All right. Now then, we are now in off the off the beaten uh, like out of the out of the sensible and into the crazy ready we've talked about this before introducing alpaderch alpaderch is this avatar that keeps showing up everywhere right so here she is in a scope video where she's the bartender when uh when he when, uh when the peacock and um Ezri Hakuzotsu are meeting uh, she's in the Kaldari trailer, like the we are Ka the Kaldari video with um, Akimaka Soraki talking, and like that shows um, Admiral. Uh, oh God, the the one name that every Kaldari citizen knows. Uh, <laughs> oh well. Um, any rate, she's there. Is it Tony to to Tovil? No, it's to Tovil, right? My, I've had so many names kicking around in my head right now that it's just confu confusing it all. At any rate. Uh, but then also she was found in this picture, which was a mock-up that was shown at FanFest. Um, and this is where we got the name Alpadurch to give to her. She also showed up originally in a uh, Tovil Tova. Yeah, see, I, okay, I, I knew I was close. <coughs> um, anywho, so she showed up as like a promotional, like the icon when uh, Eve first released on um, Epic Game Store, which is where I first noticed it because I thought that the outfit was really freaking cool. So I've been paying attention to that ever since. That's how we caught her here and here. And then she's here, where she's given the name Alpaderch. But this guy is a real person, right? So this level one agent in Sheru Ten Moon Three Sisters of Eve Bureau is a real person. But it's this guy. And he is a level one agent of the Sisters of Eve in Sheru. So yeah, everything about this picture is correct, except the model. For some reason, they reuse this or they use this model. And this is by far the most detailed version of this model that we've seen. Um, but then this happens. No, she's not the one in an uprising. She looks so consistent in every one of her pictures, which is the only reason why we've been able to identify her and all. Let 
can't see it. I bring promise of a brighter future for us all. This is an invitation. So let's talk a little bit about conspiracy, okay? Another piece of this before we move on is this picture here, right? So her at the bartender position. A lot of people would say like, oh, well, maybe it was random or they just used the model. It's nothing, nothing. Don't worry about it. Here's why I worry about it. So if we know that she is a deathless agent, then having a second deathless agent in the room is very suspicious. Remember, shortly after this meeting, uh, the entire thing gets uh, exposed. And uh, during her talk with him, which I don't have split out right now. Hold on. Uh, oh, I skipped the death glow in room. Mm. I missed one. We, let's start. We got to start the entire iceberg over. I'm just kidding. So uh, I think that uh, like. Timeline of events wise, what we have is uh, the deathless network comes under fierce scrutiny, right? The, the smuggler network gets discovered and, and put out by Concord. He's hacking the billboard, all that kind of stuff. This is happening at almost the exact same time, right? So what I think happened here is that, like, in the logs, she says that he's, like, pumping her for information about Firebird. Uh, I think that this was the setup, right? That basically the Deathless burned this whole situation and caused Operation, uh, you know, um, Contingency Omelette to trigger because he got all the information he wanted out of it and he, you know, it was, the, it was time for the next step because uh, I'm trying to remember how connected that was with Leopold, if that was at the same time as Leopold or not. Because he has, he's been having his, um, you know, he's been infiltrating these groups for a while, with Le and with and Leopold is his agent, so she's his agent. It makes sense that like there's other people in the room that also work for the Deathless, including Alpadurch. All right, Rogue Drones created the filaments. So in the Rogue Drone reports, we see. The, the Svarog and Velez Clade argue about whether or not they can work with the rogue drones. The Velez Clade say that we should... Uh, they, the Svarog Clade says that they should destroy them. The Velez Clade says... Uh, Svarog Clade that the Deviant Automata are posh... Or, sorry, they disagree that they're posh lost irredeemable and affirms tentative playful communion of Paramount Tackled Troika um, to see if they can uh, connect with them via clade pylon. So there's a missing piece of item that was never added to the game, although this description was added to the game later, just for can canon's sake. But in the same way that there was a short-range Devi or the Deviant Automata suppressor, which says strategic trach of Sparrow clade severed descends from Noema that Deviant Automata may enter Subornos with clades, Sparrow clade now time affirms imperative apostle extirpation which just means, like, Svarog just wants to kill him. We have this other item called the Wide Area Automata Command Pylon, and this is the description. Convocation of the, tri tri of Convocation of the Troika of Voidia Subclade of Velisclade divined purpose for the Deviant Automata to in the flow of Virage. The Koshoi of Voidia made a casting that the winnowing of the clades would be served by turning Poshlos to Sabornos. The Navka and Vadya of the gave Noema profound reverse time sense and grounded them a taxi. The Narania Vodya accepted the volition and merged consented in the Koshoi and the Navka of Troika Vodya. With this scribing is the working of the flow revealed as law. So pretty high flutin. What they're basically saying is that they've discovered a purpose for the rogue drones within their order, the flow of Viraj, right? That the that this would be, they would be best served by turning the posh lost into Subornos, by turning the corrupted into allies. Um, so that's the disagreement. 
right? So they kick it back over to the detached executive troika for the sublimation of Posh Lost Flow. Convocation of Triglav outside of the struggle invokes now time imperative on detached executive troika for sublimation of Posh Lost Flow to winnow through the semiosis of all discourses operating in elements in relation to deeming automaton corruption of villa, villa autopoiesis. <coughs> so basically, the convocation says, shit, we can't disagree, we, we can't agree on this. Uh, and it's causing us huge problems. So um, we need you to come up with a solution for us. Like, you, we need you to review it and give an analysis. So then uh, she does go about this and she encounters manifestations exhibit range of autonomy profiles uh organizing principles blah 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 request for com comprehensive threat profile isolated testing and analysis will be carried out by um difficulty of meshing foundational cultural motivation with distributed artificial entities despite countervailing measures from f higher functions of entities the successes of reconnaissance pulses and surveillance scatter indicate continued work to evolve relationship um and then later on they say Classification and testing has confirmed wide range of autonomy and sentient profiles. Within upper bound of sentient profiles, the distributed artificial entities present. Um, and where is it? I I can't uh, I can't find it right now. But basically, uh, they they refer to them as vermin. I think well, they do it later too. But my point is, um, so they say that like some of them are intelligent enough to work with the higher bound ones are, are smart. So, uh, opportunity threat paradox at a civilization level, consent lock decay. Now time discourse, uh, resolution of threat profiles and modeling of opportunity branches is complete within re accepted variants. Detached Nafka has returned and procession of their offering to the convocation of Triglov outside of the struggle has been grounded in Metaxi. Metaxi means like compromise, middle path. Uh, the Nafka is, it seems to be the computer version of the, of the uh, Triglavians. But there's this weird thing of like procession. Now they talk about procession a lot in this, uh, in these, um, in these reports. Uh, in fact, earlier it says, um, that the detached Nafka have imperative to return to the domain of Buyan and offer procession to the convocation of Triglov outside of the struggle. Um, and then later it says detached Nafka has returned and procession of their offering to the convocation of Triglov outside of the struggle has been grounded in a taxi. Um, I think that this word procession gets used elsewhere too. One second. Yeah, the profession, yeah, they use it quite a bit. For, or, for evolution of the procession, flow, winnowing, discourse, operating at, in elements of hive link. So it like means like moving forward, right? But here's the thing. The reason why I'm go digging, digging into this so much is that like the question is, the question I have is what purpose did Velez discover from the rogue drones? Here's what I think happened. I think that the rogue drones develop technology that allows them to burrow through space-time using minute amounts of Isogen 5, which they learned about from the other and or the Isogen 5 caches when they were taking over rogue drones. Um, these burrowing at one point managed to land inside of a Svarog clan holding which is where they start ripping it apart and, 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 you know, stealing stuff as they do. And so they, once they discover how to burrow into the Triglavian area, they start doing so more. However, the Velez figures out that, hey, we could, I, we could probably work with them. They could offer us something. If they know the way in, can they give us the way out? And the reason why I think that is because when abyssal filaments were first discovered, we had this news article. Abyssal filaments discovered in rogue drone regions and confirmed in possession of major outlaw groups. The Triglavian technology called abyssal filaments have been discovered in rogue drone controlled sites in the so-called drone regions. In an exclusive for the Scope Galactic Hour with Rhett Gloriax, veteran journalists and frontline reporters, Vet Rhett Gloriax accompanied a Thucker tribe expedition investigating 
in uh, reports in, that the rogue drone hives in the infested region may continue to contain abyssal fragment technology. Um, while I, I wasn't permitted to accompany the commandos on their mission, despite my strong objections and citing the freedom of interstellar press, I was able to view the video feeds of my interpret intrepid warriors of the Vo Lakat special task group boarded the Grim Hulk. The information of war of warfare gear neutralized the drone infestation command and control, and a good dose of cold, ha hard, m monomolecular buckshot was enough to take out the twitching remains. Uh... On the command deck, we were all stunned as the commandos found a horde of abyssal filaments in the depths of the hive. The other thing that's worth noting is that the smallest rogue drones in, uh, in the abyss are known as needles, with the larger ones known as lances. Um, and the technology that, the, uh, that ore laboratories invent... Uh, so the ore laboratories who have been doing experimentations on rogue drones come out with the needle jack filament. Um, so it is very possible uh, that the rogue drones actually invented the, or at least developed the ability to travel to and from abyssal dead space and were the original creators of the filaments, which they created in order to help the Triglavians be able to escape abyssal dead space. <coughs> uh, you think that the Triglavians use them for mutaplasmids? It's very possible that that's true too. But also they used that like they have large nano assembly machines too. So it could very well be that it was for their large scale assembly. But we also see that the, there are rogue drones working side by side the, tri the Triglavians in the Abyss by the time that we get there. So there are simpler explanations to this. But look, we're not this down. We're not this deep with for simple explanations. All right. Now we've come to the end, the conclusion the most fun. Here are my craziest theories in EVE Online. First, Talikan physics disaster. The theory goes, all of these are crazy. All of these are speculative. I have very little evidence about any of them. Don't expect me to pull up anything. Talikan physics disaster. So it is noted that no planets orbit in EVE Online. Now we know that anchors... Uh, made from pegs can be used to anchor structures and stuff so that way they don't move in space-time. But that makes it even more confusing that planets don't orbit in space-time. They spin, but they don't orbit. They stay perfectly still. So does every other moon. So here's the theory, okay? The theory goes that this is not a, this is not a bad simulation. That there was... The, that the Talikan, masters of... Of 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 folding space time and and these stellar uh uh the stellar trans not the stellar transmitters but the um like the the Dyson swarms and all that sort of stuff in their attempt to control it further control and manipulate reality through the course of the war there was a disaster which affected space time forever effectively freezing all large gravitational bodies in place. Allowing, uh, which is why all planets are fixed in position. And the only reason why we, like, nobody in EVE Online really notes this because nobody realizes that it's weird, right? Everybody, like, the, all of the planets have been frozen in place for as long as anybody knows. In their world, in their physics, planets don't orbit. They just sit there. There you go. Next theory. We are the sleepers. We are the sleepers is the theory that, okay, so there's this idea that the sleepers have forgotten that they're in the construct, right? That they've created constructs that are so realistic that especially without the Adhaduani to help them, they have lost themselves and they've forgotten that they're in the construct. And that that's one of the things that the other in particular is trying to do is convince the sleepers, show the sleepers are uh, that they are in the Matrix, convince them that they are asleep. But hold on a second. Wait a minute. That sounds like the plot of the Matrix, right? Hold on. Let's look into this. The Matrix came out in 1999. EVE Online came out like four years later. So there's all of this weird stuff about how like we're living in this false reality and we need to wake up. What if... The drifters in the game, the other, is the real other. 
and that EVE Online, as a game, exists in the construct to help us, the sleepers, realize that we are asleep. <gasps> Booyan is the Echoverse. So Booyan is the Echoverse is kind of goes back to that multi-dimensional theory, which is that basically if you see that uh, nothing is real, everything is permitted, exactly. Uh, the abyss as we know it, and what we think of as subspace, the bottom of everything, isn't actually the bottom, that it is merely a boundary, that that is the skin between our reality and another reality, which means, so the thing is, is that all of abyssal dead space that we see is not Buyan, right? See, the, the Triglavians refer to their home of Buyan, and that we will be permitted to enter Buyan, and that Buyan will be flowing into a bit, uh, ancient domains through Pochvin and all this stuff. But the, it's not the abyss itself, because those are referred to as the conduit loop constructs and are at least once referred to separately than Buyan itself. So what if Buyan is an alternate dimension that the Triglavians have actually... Remember how I said the Yan Yung were able to pass between a different dimension? What if the Triglavians have actually also bored into another dimension, but they got stuck there, right? And that the abyss itself, as we know it, is actually part of that boundary between the dimensions. And so that's what they're trying to do, is create a conduit between those two dimensions. And that's what Buyan really is. All right? <coughs> we good? Two more? Anoikis equals New Eden's future. Uh, phew. dang it. Hold on. Is this going to work? Should I not go to, I should probably not go to fail heat challenge randomly. Uh, all right, whatever. This is a bad picture of the New Eden cluster. See how it's shaped? Okay, great. This is a picture of Anoikis. If you actually like map it out based on the coordinates that are in the, the computer, like in, in the database. Now it's worth noting that CCP has said that that this is not necessarily accurate, that Anoikis is kind of an unknown location, and that the locations in the game are actually non-canonical, as it were. Um, however, it was noted that these two pictures, like, there is a lot of similarities about how abyssal dead space, or sorry, uh, the wormhole space is, um, in similar to the current map of New Eden. And so the idea is, is that wormholes are a bridge in space time. And we always think about the space side of that, but what if it's also the time part of that? What if Anoikis isn't actually physically somewhere different? What if it's New Eden in the distant future? Also, what if, uh, what if Earth, what if th th this is the future? Like, what if, like, what if we can't find Earth because of the, like, Earth is around here? Like, the, the, you get into weird, 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 weird world with that. And then finally, the Eve Gate was sabotaged. So uh, the Eve Gate collapse is a big deal, obviously. However, as we talked about earlier, there's suspicions that there was a conflict between the great empires at that time, the Yen Yong and the Talakan. And then uh, both of these have massive gravitation, like um, power over space-time itself. And whether it was the Talakan physics disaster or uh, like uh, the weapon created by uh, the, ta the 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 Isogen 5 caches, whatever it was, it would seem that it could be possible that someone slammed the door shut, right? The, the, the idea is that the, that the uh, Yan Yong or someone had actually disrupted the Eve Gate and caused the collapse of the Eve Gate intentionally in order to secure their power on in New Eden. Uh, so that's it. Yeah, that's good. So... Um, There's another piece to that, I think. 
But yeah, I think that that might be it. I think that we made it to the bottom, guys. Woo! I told you it would get faster as we went, got, got lower. So did I miss anything? Can you think of anything? What was your favorite? What, uh, and, or, or what kind of, what theory did you learn about that you want to dig into more? Or what did I get wrong? Uh, whatever it is, please make sure to comment below. Oh, I skipped something. You're right. We're going to jump all the way back up to Chalkade and Deathglow. This is really short. So uh, we talked about Chalkade uh, with the EOM and all that stuff. But basically in YC120, there is that series of um, terrorist attacks and all that stuff that was somewhat connected to the Intaki religious guy and the raids to try to take them, which ended up with the guys going after the Intaki. But during that time, the Blood Raiders did a series of attacks using Death Glow. And this was kind of weird, um, especially... Where is it? With this report. So, Arcia Elkin, the player, uh, talked smack about Chalkade on the in-game forums, or in-character forums, basically accusing him of, of having something to do with all this stuff. And, in res and shortly thereafter, we see tragedy in Dor Dom Torsad as famed residential Arboreum complex goes up in flames. Late breaking news reports from the Imperial city of Dom Torsad on Amar Prime states that the famous residential arboreum incorporating a number of noble estates has been on the scene of a major blaze. Details are confused, but several reports indicate that the inferno began in the vicinity of the estate of House Elkin and swept through the ancient and rare trees and plant plantings of that section of the arboreum complex. Authorities refused to confirm or deny reports of arson or and rioting, but one eyewitness had told Scope Galactic Hour with Rhett Gloriax that several vi visitors to the arboreum quote, suddenly ran amok and then exploded into fireballs. The claimed suicidal firebombing attacks is then said to have started a major blaze that destroyed much of the Arboreum and gutted the main palace of the estate, uh, Elkin estate. Unconfirmed reports suggest that several members of the noble house Elkin are missing at this time. So that's cool. Um, and if you want to know more about that and, and its relationship and the accusation that this proves that Chalkade was somehow involved in the death glow attacks going on at this time, I have a video with uh, Arcia Elkins from two years ago called Chakade is EOM. Who is Chakade? Who is EOM? So we're talking about that during, uh, in response to the dread attacks. So I will link that. Boom. Uh, yeah, and that's it. That's all. But the uh, Talikans and Yenung were, were contemporaries with were Earth. I assume they came after. Well, I mean, that is... Well, the, uh, the Talikan and Yenung existed before the Eve Gate collapse. At least one of them. Because there's reports... Uh, like in Inheritance, they refer to something being year, thousands of years before uh, the Eve Gate collapse, I think it was. All right. Well, on that note, uh, let's see. Tomorrow. Tomorrow, we will be talking about... Um, oh, yeah, that's actually a really interesting... That is, that is another conspiracy theory that, like, I've heard before, which is that the, the whoever sabotaged the Eve Gate, like the Talikan or the Yen Yung, were actually, like, good and proper aliens. <laughs> but I don't know about all that. Uh... But New Eden is only a cluster. What do we know about the rest of the galaxy? Very, very little. Uh, all right. So tomorrow, uh, I, I want to be really talking about preparing for uh, Havoc. I'm sure we'll have more news to talk about, it would seem. We still haven't gotten our dev blog for the week, I don't think. Uh, and then, of course, we've got the weekend um, where we're going to... It's your last weekend to prepare for Havoc. And then next week, Havoc! Uh, yesterday, I did a special extra stream uh on wednesday my normal day off uh for raid shadow legends um i had a lot of fun and i you know they're not paying me to say this part and so i want to say that i unironically really do love raid shadow legends and i've been playing it a lot it's kind of my new shtick 
um, especially as I'm waiting for Havoc. So, um, like you, I would encourage you to check out that video and, and so, because I not only talk about why, but I also show off a little bit about like how to get started. Yes, the New Eden News has a lot of fun little stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, the, there are no aliens in Eve. The devs, the story is of e humans being bad to humans. So, yeah. All right. Well, don't do it. It's a trap, says Bayonex. Yeah. Bayonex has been consumed. It's all right. One of us. Well, my coffee's out and the iceberg is over. So, without that said, with all that said, I've been Astrothy. I've been playing this game since 2010, talking about it since 2012, and I'm here to put even into context for you, my fellow Empyreans. Thank you guys so much. And of course, extra special thanks to my top sponsors, uh, supporters, uh, Abyssus, Aikiwara Zuchan, Arcus Earling, Belligerent Neckbeard, Black Rose Noble, Dejat Lamont, Drake, Federation Frontlines, Ganai, J. Kuhn, Lumi, Midnight Space Monkey, Milk, Not Just Fun, Seeds of Plenty, Serenalin with No Eyes, Shodanar, Celiana Valesh, Tijen Tijen, Nephilim, Grendel, V Rod Cruiser, Yenti Lipoof, Zolnex, Zero, as well as my immortal tier supporters, 745 MPSI, Aradenika the Queen, Ebo Leet, May, Malik Starfire, Mercuton, Nephilim, LM1, Sheesh, and Rid. Thank you guys so much. But that's all from me. I have been Ashrathi, the voice of New Eden. And until next time, I'll see you in space. See